just a minute. We're going to breeze through our roll call real quick, and then I'll have you um, just state your name after when we do general comment. So real quick, roll call, please. Councilor Baybine. Present. Councilor Donovan. Here. Councilor Katarina. Present. Councilor St. Clair. Here. Councilor Blaze. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Chairholder. And I'm here, too. So that brings us to item four, general public comment. And if you would, just come up to the podium and state your name and, and what you're doing visiting with us tonight. <laughs> I'm Connor Beanie, and um, we're visiting here because we want to learn about citizenship for the merit badge we're working on. Nice. Great. My name is Ethan Lowell, and I am in Troop 47, and I am here for the reason that he just stated. We're learning about citizenship in the community. I'm Jonas Balunas, and I'm here what they just said. <laughs> Politician. I'm Bryce Wheeler, and I'm here to earn a Boy Scout merit badge. I'm Eric Smith in 247, and what well, they all said. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I wish you all the best of luck with your badge, and thank you for joining us this evening. Right, thank you. So that is our headway into item number four, which is general public comment. General public comment is for non-agenda items. So if you have something that is not an agenda item, please rise and come to the podium and state your name and address, and you do have three minutes. All right. And going. And all right. So we're going to go ahead and close general public comments. Item number five is minutes of the March 18th, 2015 meeting. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. And is there any discussion? And saying none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Adjustments to the agenda, there are none. Items to be signed, I will sign later in the meeting. Item number eight is non-action items, which we have none. So that brings us into order number 15-019 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 302, the Town of Scarborough Town Rules, Policies, and Procedures Manual as recommended by the Rules and Policies Committee. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on this item? Name, address, podium. And saying none, we'll close the public comment and the public hearing. And is there a motion? Approved. Motion approved. Second. Second. And is there any discussion? All right. And um, my apologies. Tom, would you please um, just give us a recap um, for, for those at home on, on what this item was about? Yes. Uh, it actually proposes to amend two different portions of the Rules, Policies, and Procedures Manual for the Council, uh, both of them fairly simple. Uh, the first deals with appointees. The suggestion uh, from the committee is to require all new appointees uh, to serve an initial one-year term, really to allow the, the appointee and the committee to assess whether it's a good match. Uh, and the second had to do with adding some specificity to the decorum section. Uh, this is essentially the rules that the council lives by and expects everyone that uh, is in these chambers to abide by while they're here. Uh, just to add some further clarity as to what the expectation is in that regard. Just as an aside, as a matter of practice, we'll continue to uh, post decorum here in the chamber so everyone is aware before they take the podium, and I hope they take the time to read it. Thank you, Tom. And one last chance. Is there any yeah. discussion? Or? Yeah, I just I was um, not here at the last meeting, so I wasn't able to kind of weigh in on this, and I'm just happy to see it. Um, I think there's been some some bumps over the last year. Um, things have gotten at times out of hand and really disrespectful, and uh, I'm happy to see this <coughs> moving forward. I think that um, we all can be respectful of each other, um, and I mean us and the uh, citizens, residents of Scarborough, and I think this is just a really important piece, so I'm happy to see it. Thank you. And anybody else? All right, and um, just just to recap one one slight change that did happen at our last reading, um, there was the line that was added um, in the upfront for as, or as um, for the one year appointment or as otherwise determined by the council. Um, we do have some folks that are very 
generous with sharing their time and, and serve on multiple committees sometimes. So we've thought that might be a good idea to streamline for folks that are already well familiar with, you know, the, the commitment that it takes and, and those sorts of things. Um, so seeing no further discussion, all those in favor? Yeah, and that is unanimous. On to order number 15-024 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a liquor license from Eva Tucci. Tucci? Mm -hmm. Doing business as Pleasant Hill Cafe, located at 132 Pleasant Hill Road. Again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and pleasure of the council. Move Move approval. Approval. <laughs> approval. Second. And any discussion? All right. And seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. So old business is order number 15-020, which is the second reading on the bond order for the 2015 municipal and school capital improvement budgets. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? And seeing none, we'll skip right over to a motion. So First and seconded, and discussion. And I'm looking, looking, looking. All right. No discussion. discussion. No discussion. To say. Um, before we do, this is a roll call vote. Before we do that, um, I will have, I'm, I'm dropping the ball. Tom, would you please talk a little bit about the, the, the bond order as just a recap so everybody Certainly, knows what uh, we're talking about? All of these items that are proposed for bonding, uh, and that's varying lengths of financing, I should add, uh, spanning from one year in, in one case uh, to as many as 20 years is the maximum, at least on this list. And it's for projects that have either been previously approved by a prior council through the budget process or voter approved, such as some of the land acquisition uh, bonds that are on this list as well. So this is really an affirmation or a direction, I should say, to staff uh, that, that we can go out and secure uh, longer term financing, if you will, um, for these various projects. As a practical matter, many of them have already been completed and paid for, and so these proceeds end up kind of reimbursing the town. Uh, but this is a kind of an annual formality, if you will, um, and it will prepare us for bond sale later this month. And if I think just to add on to that, I think, Tom, we did talk about these were things already been approved by other, but it's on the finance committee's sort of Oh, agenda yes. this yes. year to take a look at the policy and take a look at how we're going to do this in the future. So it is something we're going to look at and consider and try to come up with some guidelines. <clears throat> yeah, excellent point. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, there is a policy that provides <clears throat> guidance to staff. Uh, that's certainly going to be part of the conversation. Councillor Babine, uh, in, in terms of his position as chairman of the Finance Committee, has indicated a willingness, uh, perhaps after we've moved through the budget, to have a workshop or two. At the finance committee level to understand all the elements related to uh, to debt and financing. All right. Any other discussion? All right. Oh, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor? Oh, roll call. oh sorry. Roll call. Yes. Yeah. Roll call. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Baybine? Yes. Councilor Donovan? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor St. Clair? Yes. Councilor Blaze? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Council Chair Holbrook? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, on to the next item, which is Order 15-025, Act on the names posted to the various committees and boards on the March 18th Town Council meeting as recommended by the Appointments Committee. And does anybody wish to speak on this item? And... Councilors, we'd love to hear you, but your microphones aren't working. Ours are... These ones are. Oh. Are yours? Sounds like they're, they're working. Must be the bag. Oh, they may not have that. Try yours closer. Maybe Hello. You might, yeah, maybe you. No. They might. Here we go. <laughs> We're having a few technical difficulties apparently this evening. <laughs> Is that better? That's better. Thank you. Excellent. So, just to repeat, order number 15-025 is an act on the names posted to the various committees and boards on the March 18th Town Council meeting as recommended by the Appointments Committee. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? And seeing none, pleasure of the Council. Move approval. Second. And any discussion? No, I just think both of these people are, um, as, a, as a member of the Appointments Committee, um, I think these are both good choices. 
and I think we're going to be lucky to have them. Thank you for that. And anybody else? All right, saying none. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. So, on to new business, which is order number 15-026, presentation and first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2016 <coughs> municipal school budget. Now, before we take, um, well, I will do this a little differently, actually. Before we take comments on this, um, let's go ahead and go through the presentation, and then we'll take, take public comment. Um, I did also want to offer um, one extra note on, on this particular item. We have scheduled a second reading tentatively for, I believe that was May 6th. No, it's May 20. May. Second reading, final adoption, May 20. First, second reading, May. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was May 6th. May 6th in our, in our oh, paperwork, sorry. I thought. I had it as May 20. It should be May 20. At least that's the timeline the finance, the joint Public finance hearing. committee's talked about. Public hearing. Uh, yeah, it's May 6. Oh, May 6. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> On occasion. Um, that was a slight change, I know, from um, an original thought process that we had had. Um, that there was a concept about potentially doing the public forum, which is a QA and a um, that the finance committee is going to be doing. Um, we decided to plug that in as four separate meetings that way. The focus and the intent of, of the forum stays for, for questions and answers. And then after receiving some more feedback, we can have a separate public hearing on May 6th. And that still puts us in our timeline of May 20th for second reading. So, um, so if you would like to go sure. ahead and be on yes, the hot I'll seat. And I do apologize. We appear to have uh, a real simple technical glitch that we hope uh, tape will take care of. Uh, the connection from the computer to um, the system here is, seems to be failing us, so bear with us. So this evening, um, it really marks a, a pretty monumental evening for myself and staff. Uh, tonight really culminates uh, three months of work on our part. This year was particularly challenging in that we've chosen to change the format of the budget that we present. Uh, you all have been presented with a copy before you this evening. Uh, we have provided copies to the members of the school board and also uh, to members of the press. Um, what we'd like to do tonight is start with uh, a quick uh, overview of the, the kind of town-wide picture and talk about town expenditures. Uh, we'll be joined uh, by Superintendent Entwistle uh, for his portion of the budget, which is a bit of a departure from, from pre uh, past practice. Uh, this is a, an outgrowth of the efforts uh, between the Joint Finance Committees working for the last several months, and we thought it would be helpful to uh, have a little more substance on the school side. Generally, I've simply pre presented the bottom line numbers, and that really doesn't tell much of a story whatsoever. So we'll be collaborating this evening and kind of going back and forth and working through the presentation. Um, then we'll talk about revenues, capital projects, and then some of the housekeeping items related to adoption and review process. So, unfortunately. Well, they all went down you, this time. Luckily, I have the IT director here. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if she can help. With her duct, uh, duct tape. <laughs> duct tape. Yeah. So, again, I apologize. Bear with me. So, first thing that we helps inform myself and staff is the council's budget goal. And forgive me, uh, there's a number of different strategies that the council articulated this year in their budget session early in January. I've, I think, captured the essence, if you will. There's a number of other ones. Uh, those are all online if you wish to look further. But these are the guiding principles that I've taken forward and tried to work with uh, in crafting this budget. Uh, those have also been transmitted to the school as well, and, and I think it was, they were certainly mindful of them. So that's just kind of a backdrop of, of where we are. This year we have adopted a new approach, as I alluded to. Uh, that approach uh, in, has involved the two finance committees of the town and the school, uh, somewhat unprecedented. And I, I'll speak from my own perspective. I think it's been an unqualified success to date. Uh, this group has worked very well together, and I think they've established a level of, of rapport that I think might be tested as we go forward, uh, but it's important to have that relationship in place. And so we, we spent the time up front to establish that relationship, and I think that will reap dividends. 
Beyond that, as I mentioned, uh, this budget is presented in a different format. Uh, the Town Finance Committee was quite clear uh, in wanting to look at more of a macro perspective rather than diving into the details and the line item detail of the budget. Uh, and it's very easy to do that and to frankly get lost in, 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 in those weeds, uh, so to speak. And so this budget is presented in uh, that different format that really encourages a broader perspective. Um, I have provided the line item detail in the back of the document uh, should we need to and you wish to look at that level of detail, but we're really reporting on some high, higher level um, categories of spending. Um, you'll notice that the new format uh, follows a general pattern, and that is for each department to explain their basic uh, functions and activities. So in a page, and I assure you it's difficult to summarize the various and different and important things that each town department does in a single page, uh, but my staff has done a, a wonderful job to distill uh, the important things and complicated things they do into a single page format. Beyond that, I've uh, encouraged them to uh, call out different cost drivers or budget drivers, what's really making the difference in their budget this year. So someone can, in a fairly quick read, get a pretty good sense of what apartment does, how they're structured, what's driving them from a financial point of view, and we're also reporting on something we call activity indicators, which uh, are things that will map and trend and calculate over time. And so this is still a work in progress, um, but I'm pleased to have made this push, and I think you'll find, I'm hopeful, that it's going to provide for a, 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 a deeper discussion, a more thoughtful discussion about where our priorities are, where our costs are. One of the challenges that we always face is external budget pressures, and this year is no different. In fact, it might be the worst yet. Uh, the state runs on a biennial system, so they pass uh, a two-year budget. Uh, they're in the throes of uh, reviewing and discussing that budget as we speak. Uh, the governor starts that process, not unlike what I'm doing this evening for the council. Um, and inevitably, there will be changes perhaps significant changes. No one quite knows what those will be and what the effect is. So uh, I should mention at the outset, on the town side, I've not assumed uh, any financial impact. And I think that's uh, the best way to approach it at this juncture, though we need to pay very close attention to what's happening in, in Augusta and be able to react as you go through your adoption process. Uh, I should also mention that uh, my, my sense is that if uh, some or all of the governor's proposals do get through. We have done the analysis. We do have a pretty deep appreciation for how those affect us. And a number of them actually have positive effects on us. So there may be good news, for all I know, before this budget process is done. On the, on the school side, however, I think almost everyone that's paid attention to this appreciates that the proposed cuts to general purpose aid are very likely to, uh, to be realized. And so this budget does assume that fact. Um, again, we will have to assess that as we go forward, but I think that's a, 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 an appropriate um, assumption at the outset. And as I mentioned, the state budget, uh, you know, is in process. Uh, the go though the governor's uh, proposed it, it is being deliberated and reviewed by the legislature and must be adopted by them, and inevitably through that process things will change. So um, hang on, it could be a bumpy ride. Perhaps the most challenging thing to us is that the bu budget if two years ago is any indication, is not likely to be finalized at the state level until mid or late June. Uh, and that presents a challenge to us just in terms of timing. So all of those things are in play, and uh, we've, tr we've done our best to try to forecast what the effect of those might be on us, but uh, it is a dynamic process. Here's a quick look at uh, the gross and the net budgets for the town. A couple of simple takeaways on the gross side this doesn't take, gross doesn't take into consideration any non-property um, non tax revenues. Uh, from a gross perspective, the town represents 41% of spending, the school 56%, and the county at 3%. And then when you transition to the bottom graph, uh, the numbers change quite a bit. Uh, and, and that's really due in, entirely to the fact that the school has no, or virtually very few, I should say, um, sources of revenue other than general purpose aid from the state. And there's a, 
there's a various and sundry smaller ones through activity fees and such, but they don't amount to a, a, a big difference. So on the net basis, the town represents 29% of the budget. The school moves up to 67% and the county up to 4%. Here's a quick look, just big picture uh, on the three major uh, aspects between town, school, and county. Town spending is proposed to go up 3.81%, just over a million dollars. Uh, the school, and this includes adult education, is uh, proposed to go up 7.65%, uh, about $3.3 million. Again, this is expenditures only. And the county is proposed to go up about 5.8%. I, I, again, I apologize. This proposal, before I go home this evening, I'll do my best effort to get it up on the website so you'll have it available to you. Uh, this was not the plan, obviously. Um, and so all told, we're looking at a 6.1% uh, increase for gross appropriations, about $4.5 million. Let's dig a little deeper, uh, first on the town side, and then I'll turn to my colleague, Mr. Pussel, on the school side. Uh, the overview for the town side, and this uh, we're, we're reporting here, uh, based on these broad categories uh, that we've come up with in the new format, uh, showing general government, public service, public safety, public works, and debt. Uh, there's a lot more detail underneath these, but these give a, a quick snapshot at uh, what's happening in those different functions of town government, coming up to the 3.8 percent. If we dig a bit deeper, um, well, I should say that there are a number of factors driving these things, and I can certainly attribute numbers to them, but I can tell you the four items at the top half of this sheet, uh, all of which are going up, uh, represent over a million bucks to the town budget. And the first has to do with wage uh, increases. We have two contracts that are up for negotiation this spring uh, that will expire at the end of June. So we need resources to settle those going forward. There's also uh, compensation for non-union staff included there as well. Uh, this is the first full year of the dispatch, new dispatch personnel. Uh, this is the cooperative relationship with Old Orchard Beach. Those staff, those four new staff members started February 1st this current year. And so this year realizes the full annualized cost of those employees. So it shows itself as an additional expense. There's an offsetting revenue, uh, but nonetheless it shows itself as an, as an expense. Uh, I don't have to remind anyone here uh, winter maintenance, uh, it's been a, been a rough winter. We've, uh, we've really uh, moved all the way through and used all of our stockpile materials. This is essentially salt and sand. And so we would like and propose to uh, restock uh, the sheds, if you will. And uh, so it's not a typical year in that regard. That's about $135,000 expense between salt and sand uh, restocking. And Mr. Shaw will certainly provide some more detail in that regard. Health insurance, we're uh, budgeting a 5% increase at this point. Uh, that's a big number when you look at uh, across all employees. And debt service uh, is up as well. So again, those uh, drivers, I call them, represent over a million dollars in additional expense. And you might recall, we're up about 1.1 million. So on that page, those five items really collectively represent the increase on the municipal side. Uh, the good news is there's a couple of things that are coming in under budget. Uh, one is uh, I'll be proposing to the council that we share assessing services with the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I hope uh, to deliver that recommendation at your next, next meeting. Uh, that's, that's likely to deliver about $60,000 in savings to the town. Um, and also solid waste tipping fees based on a proposal that's come through the finance committee uh, regarding a pay as you throw program. Uh, we have included some savings uh, through, as a result of increased recycling. Essentially, we'll have to dispose of less trash and therefore save money. So those are two kind of positive things that have, that have happened. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about what's not in the budget, and I'm a bit sheepish to stand here and, and, and admit this, but um, my staff has brought forward uh, nine different proposed positions and, and have all made uh, very convincing and compelling arguments uh, for each of them. Yet I, I could not find myself uh, proposing those and in, including them in the budget 
but I would strongly encourage uh, the Finance Committee, as you meet with departments, to spend the time and to, to listen to those proposals. I have included um, uh, some details on those proposals uh, in the back of your budget and under tab 9 there's an exhibit section and uh, we've prepared them in a kind of a, a quick format so you can, it's a pretty quick read uh, but uh, at least the police and fire positions are based on staffing plans that this council or past councils have seen and approved and uh, this is a further deviation from that plan if you will and and I, I really feel strongly that each of these uh, could stand on its own merits, and if all things being equal, um, I'd be proposing all of them. Uh, but I, I, again, look for your willingness to have that conversation. Uh, you need to appreciate that these needs are out there for a community that continues to grow and, and service demands continue to grow along with that. So I'd like to turn uh, the conversation over to my colleague, Dr. Entwistle to give you some perspective on the school side of the expenditures. Okay, Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I first want to uh, thank members of the Leadership Council uh, who worked so hard uh, as they always do, uh, but most important, very collaboratively uh, to develop a credible and um, uh, solid, I think, uh, school budget. Um, I wanna, I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, you can read the slides. I'm not going to read them to you, but I'll point out some interesting things. Hopefully, you'll find them to be interesting. Uh, for more than 40 months now, the leadership team, uh, the faculty in our schools, uh, the school board who's present tonight, and I um, have all thoughtfully and strategically worked to improve uh, the quality and efficiency of the systems and the structures and the programs that we have in our schools. The good news uh, that I am happy to share with you is that um, that work has resulted in the delivery of higher quality teaching and learning to Scarborough students. Uh, this budget basically identifies what we call mission critical resources um, and those are resources that are needed to make sure that all students uh, that we have here in Scarborough are going to be successful. Um, uh, we're going to get them ready to be successful in college um, as productive workers and as engaged and contributing citizens like our young men who are sitting in the middle of the audience here learning about citizenship and the importance of um, civic engagement. So we've been uh, following an improvement plan, uh, that's the 40 month path that we've been on, uh, to build a, a high performing what we call learning organization. And for a school to be a learning organization is a very good thing. For any organization to be a learning organization is a good thing, but particularly for schools who have historically been a little resistant to change. This, um, let's see. Be careful, it, it advances whether you see it or not, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're, you're flipping way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, what I want to do, uh, this is the objectives, um, a credible student-centered budget, um, again, a continuous improvement and efficiency focus. Um, what this budget focuses on this year are those mission-critical resources to, as I said, get students ready um, and create a high-performing organization. Um, and I think most important as well is to make good on the investments that have been made um, here since uh, FY12 into the school. Okay, when this slide comes up, I, um, I think I will be, yep, I will be um, providing an overview of the four components of the school operating budget. I'm gonna be a little bit more detailed uh, because I do think that um, part of this uh, is instructive for the uh, for the public to really understand 
um, how school budgets work. Uh, they're not quite as simple as people may think. Um, I'm also going to be providing a current status update on what's projected for each category of expenditure um, as it stands today. Um, but this more detailed explanation is really required even in this introduction. So while most expenditure projections are firm, and I think this is important to know, there are some important expenditures, some big ones, that you're seeing up there. Quick look. <laughs> <laughs> They're up there. Um, <laughs> some big ones that are still in play. Uh, they're in flux. For example, salaries, <coughs> wages, and benefits make up the biggest by far expenditure for any school district, and we are not any exception. Basically, that is carrying 75% of our costs are right in that one category. The reason is that schools are people business, and they're multi-service agencies providing a broad array of not only educational but social and therapeutic services to the students that walk through our doors every day. In our case, here, to over 3,100 students. Um, in this category, when the slide comes back on, you will see, there it is, um, an increase right now where we're sitting of 6.76%. .6 the bulk of salaries and wages and benefits are determined by collective bargaining contracts, as you probably know. Uh, just a couple of those have not yet been settled, but the teacher's contract, kind of the, kind of the lead contract within the schools, um, has been settled, um, and it actually covers about 55% of our total employees. That budget right now, it, I mean, that uh, contract right now is in the second year of a three-year <coughs> contract. The school board and a majority of our employees covered under that bargaining unit have agreed to some structural changes um, in benefits that will result in significant cost savings um, and containment over the life of those contracts. So our negotiation team um, and the school board is to be congratulated for that work um, as well, recognizing our, our staff's uh, cooperation with that. That said, our increase in benefits um, has not yet been finalized. As Tom says, he's carrying 5%. We were carrying 8%. We've just learned that we will not have it any bigger than 5%, but we're hoping for some good news um, when the increase is finally settled. Up there you see as well, or you might have seen uh, when it flashed, uh, charter school tuition. And uh, charter school tuition um, is going to really depend on what happens up in Augusta. Um, but there, there may uh, be some uh, positive adjustment there. So there is a possibility, even with this budget presentation and the numbers we're looking at, um, that there's, a, uh, there's upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that still may be reduced in this very big category. Um, and uh, you'll see on the bottom line, special services tuition um, has increased, uh, just uh, for your knowledge, more than $100,000. And that's pretty much an uncontrollable cost. Uh, debt service, um, B, is the second component. Uh, it's driven, as you know, by school projects that have been approved by the town's voters. This number is still an estimate at this time, um, but we're hoping uh, to not see it be larger than it's currently estimated. The last two uh, of the four components, uh, when the slide comes up again, you'll see are categories that are uh, what I call discretionary components. Uh, the um, interesting piece is that they only um, amount to less than 1% of the whole budget. So the Education Improvement Plan identifies the mission-critical investments that my leadership and I are belie believe are absolutely necessary to keeping the momentum to our ongoing improvement work. These investments, I have to emphasize, are bare bones um, and they are not representing the accurate um, and genuine uh, level of student needs in our schools. The initiatives uh, included in our um, EIP, you're familiar with CIP, but the in, in Education Improvement Plan 
are connected to the medium and long-term goals. Um, and these investments that you will take a deeper look at are for incremental step-by-step -step improvements. I'll share an overview of the plan. Uh, the proposed increase for mission critical investments has been scrubbed and scrubbed by the Leadership Council and myself. Um, I can tell you it has been reduced um, even at that $335,842 number um, by, by probably close to two-thirds. It sits now at that uh, three, approximately $336,000 um, and um, I'm going to look at those exp uh, expenditures with you. Uh, there's also on here uh, technology, and re technology renewal and replacement line. It's a line that keeps um, a small reserve in the operating budget um, that perhaps would be found in CIP. It doesn't need to be bonded necessarily. Uh, this is still a very conservative amount when you see it uh, come up. Um, and what it does is keep um, technology running efficiently. Uh, there you see at the bottom line, 98,225. It keeps technology running efficiently across the six schools. Uh, typically, no dollars have historically been placed in this account. And we have been trying to reconcile this shortcoming. And we're making that effort again. The short story about uh, school expenditures is carried here on this list of drivers. I won't read them to you, but like the town, a handful of increases, non-negotiable increases, can really quickly add up to a significant amount of money. The FY16 story is captured in six drivers on this slide. Uh, they are tuition increases, insurance increases, cost shifting from the state, and previously approved debt service, and they add up to over $1.1 million in expenditures. Here's an overview of the components of the Education Improvement Plan. Um, when you uh, see anything that is in red or an orange color, uh, that's actually one of the items that make up the net increase of $335,842. The reason why it's a net increase is that um, school leaders have, in some instances, been able to reallocate existing funds, basically, and essentially what they're doing is to defray the cost of some of these investments, they're moving some resources from what they've determined to be a lower priority, priority to these that are considered highest priority. The K-2 story, they continue to focus on uh, implementation of a new English language arts curriculum, on supporting numbers of, increasing numbers of, of kindergarten students with behavioral needs, and on the Jump Start program. That's an, a, a school readiness program, which helps incoming students to be better prepared for a good start in school and a good success, um, rather than trying to uh, do the, the tremendous work that's involved in trying to catch them up later. Tremendous strides have been made at K2 with um, a four-day-a-week technology integrator and the one uh, investment uh, being requested uh, by K2 uh, is a point two of a uh, technology integrator. That's essentially adding one day to the technology integrator's schedule. I think um, we all agree that uh, we're all thankful for and pleased with the very beautiful new Wentworth School, and we, we uh, thank the community for that support. Uh, one, while some incremental investments have al allowed our middle school to make good progress on restoring uh, world language or foreign language programs, at, um, at Wentworth that same progress is probably still a few years away. But taking priority this year, however, for Wentworth is advancing student access to more science and technology engagement and education. And there you see the requested investment of a science technology teacher for grade three. That's a 1.0 teaching position request. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, world language, we're going to try some more innovative and creative approaches and see how they work. Um, and. Uh, and, and go from there. It was the middle school last year that basically uh, took the lion's share of the investments that were made in K-12. This year uh, they have stepped back, uh, but they will continue to do their good work through FY16. 
Uh, their focus is on the development of their middle school learning commons, as you see up there. Um, and for those for whom that language is unfamiliar, you can read new library model um, instead of learning commons. Um, and they're also figuring out how to provide students um, with access to some, um, some badly needed uh, gui guidance services. Um, but they're doing that without any new investments this year. Um, at the high school, we see a proposal for a technology integrator. Um, they have no technology integrator now. Um, this is an investment that's been a component and part of the discussion for building one-to-one -one technology capacity for our Scarborough High School students, um, which I'm sure you've heard about. I will give you some references to check on that if um, uh, there's some great materials on the um, website uh, for folks to take a look at if they want to see that, uh, the proposals. Um, adequate guidance services remains a long-term goal, uh, but adding point two of an art teacher, that's again, that's just another day of, of an art teacher working, and one education technician to the learning commons, um, those are the most mission critical needs at our high school. And um, I would say that the high school um, uh, has been um, in need of making advancements in all of these areas, technology, um, guidance services for sure, um, and uh, adding richness to electives uh, for our high school students, and, um, and also jumping on the bandwagon in terms of creating a 21st century uh, learning common for our high school. There's three other uh, pieces here, athletics and activities. Um, as you know, we continue to offer a very robust selection of uh, athletics and activities, uh, particularly for our high school students. Increasing concerns, you've read about it in, in the press, relate to concussions and other kinds of student injuries that, are, that, that, sh that should be preventable. Um, and these things have prioritized adding uh, some additional athletic trainer capacity um, to athletics and activities. Uh, there's other goals and objectives within athletics and activities and we're just not able to address them at this time. Our uh, special services um, is driven, uh, the changes there are really driven on the basis of uh, student needs and um, the level of st student needs have really resulted this year in an uncharacteristically higher than usual proposal coming out of our special services department. Um, in order to meet these needs, additional teaching and behavioral resources are needed. You see them there in red, um, uh, along with the, the addition of a, that's a point one PT, which is actually about half a day of PT services, but it's essentially needed. Our special services uh, leaders do a yeoman job of controlling costs. Um, as an example, what you don't see up there in terms of us asking for staff is as many as six um, ed techs um, who uh, were, were, are not being added as, as new positions, but instead are being um, uh, shifted to work with populations that have um, uh, higher priority needs that have emerged. Um, this option will uh, negate the need to add more staff positions uh, beyond what is requested there for special services. District-wide work continues to focus on a new and more rigorous teacher and principal evaluation model um, and advancing curriculum improvement and refinement in all content areas across all schools. Um, and there are no new investments um, that are being requested. There you see the total of um, of 335, uh, 300, roughly $336,000. Um, it is in total uh, six full-time equivalent positions are reflected in the overall request for our new teaching positions. One is an ed tech position, and then there are bits of service time that are added to existing positions or services we're providing, which really constitute the sixth um, position. Is it me, or are these slides staying up longer? Um, here we have an overview of what I've just walked you through. I'm not going to read the numbers to you. Each of the four categories are again presented here, A, B, C, D. Again, it's important to recognize the relatively minute impact that C and D have on an overall expenditure picture in that together they make up 
uh, less than 1% of the proposed uh, FY16 expenditures. It's also important as we're looking at numbers to recognize that the 12% number that is being bandied about is uh, relative to an estimated change in a yet unfinalized school budget and it does not represent a projection of change in tax bills. Tom? Quick question. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, there was discussion of computers for all the high school students. Where are those in the numbers? Um, Tom will be addressing that. They are. They're in the CIP. The, there is a. There is. Um, I, I identified a technology integrator position yeah. at the high school, yeah. um, and there are. There's some effort for us to put some money in our operating budget in terms of. Uh, IT peripherals and, and supplies that are needed that shouldn't be in CIP and the bulk of the devices and all that's needed for one-to-one -one <laughs> is, pr um, is presented as a proposal in the C uh, school CIP. Okay, so it's not in these numbers, it's in it is the, not capital in the CapEx number that, yeah. That, that's Thank correct. <clears throat> Thank you. So you've heard uh, an overview of both the town and the school expenditure, expenditure side of the equation. Let's spend a few moments and talk about the revenue side, which all of which uh, certainly affects the bottom line. This is a quick slide that shows a, a graph of all townwide revenues. Uh, the big takeaway, I think, is that uh, over 70 percent of, uh, of revenues are property tax based. And I don't have to remind anyone in this room uh, that is the, that's the pinch point. That's really uh, ever increasing putting pressure. Uh, on this conversation, and uh, we've seen uh, a steady growth of that reliance on property tax through a number of, uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, the Council and School Board had a, a session earlier, um, I believe in the order of 86 percent of school costs are property tax supported, and, uh, and, and therein is, is really the story, I think. Here's, uh, again, a, a very broad look at uh, municipal and school revenue picture. Uh, town revenues are proposed to go up uh, nine, over 9 percent, over a million dollars. And we'll get into some of the reasons why. Whereas the school side is seeing uh, a reduction of about 1.2 million, or over 16.5 percent reduction. The lion's share of that is uh, state aid going down. Here's a picture of non-property tax revenue sources. So this is all the other sources. Uh, the biggest piece of that pie, over 50 percent, uh, are made up of town-wide revenues. Um, there's a whole strange uh, bunch of things in there, and we can talk about uh, the details of, of what make that up. Uh, the other things I'd just point out for your, your benefit, um, revenue sharing makes up just under 3 percent. Uh, it's about $750,000. Uh, in relatively speaking, it's not a big big deal, but uh, the year that that goes away, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. Um, that, incidentally, is proposed um, in the governor's budget to happen in year two of the state budget. So it's not an issue for FY16, but it's likely to be a conversation point for uh, next year. Uh, so it's something that we ought to be thinking about uh, going forward. And the education subsidy is, is shown in the uh, lighter color blue. It represents 14.7 uh, percent of those non-property tax revenues. Uh, about $3.7 million is what we project for next year, uh, a number that's been, uh, that's going down <coughs> significantly. Here's a couple of takeaways, uh, kind of details on revenues. Uh, on the school side, the picture is bleak. It's all about decreases. So I mentioned earlier, GPA going down by over a million dollars. Uh, they also propose uh, not to use as much fund balance. That actually shows itself as a, as a, uh, as a loss of non-property tax revenue, if you will. Um, and so those two factors alone account for uh, really the entirety of their, of their loss in the revenue side. On the town side, uh, the positive things, we do see a continued uh, uptick in excise tax collections. And so there's $235,000 uh, in additional revenue that we're projecting there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first year of the uh, full year, if you will, of the relationship with Old Orchard, Old Orchard Beach for dispatch. And so that does have an offsetting revenue. So 
as you might recall earlier, yes, we have more expense in public safety for those uh, staff members. We have offsetting revenue to cancel that out. And then uh, the, the new element in this budget uh, is a pay-as-you-throw program. It's a matter that the Finance Committee has discussed and encouraged me to include in the budget, and it will certainly be a source of some conversation going forward. Uh, I'll get into, in the next slide, some of the particulars of that, uh, but there is a, a, a revenue component um, that's included. Very quickly, one single slide on this, and I will mention Council Chair uh, Holbrook has already called for a workshop uh, in these chambers, I believe it's 6 p.m. on April 15th, uh, specifically on this matter, so more, more to come. Uh, but in terms of how, what assumptions we've made in this budget, uh, the whole program is based on the goal of cutting waste, increasing recycling, and over saving money overall. And it's based on assumptions that we get to 45 percent uh, recycling rate. We're currently I believe in the 32 range, 32 percent. Um, in, in, as we increase recycling, we'll reduce the total volume of solid waste, MSW, that we have to pay to get rid of. Uh, it's really based, in essence, on equity and a user fee system. If you use it, you pay for it. If you don't, you don't. And it would certainly be combined with the existing curbside recycling program, the carts that we've all come to use and, and, and I think be pleased with would still be used in this program. We would just be putting the, a different bag inside them. And lastly, it's based on a September 1 start date. Uh, the wisdom there is that this uh, should it go forward would need some time to educate and, and implement, if you will. And so uh, we're not assuming a July 1st start date. It would be a, a bit of a delay. Uh, and the benefits that accrue from such a program, as I mentioned, are cost avoidance through disposing of less solid waste. And um, we estimate that to be about $140,000 a year. And then there would be sales and uh, sales of bags as well. And there are certainly environmental benefits that are hard to quantify in dollars and cents, but I think it's worth mentioning. So that kind of completes the quick overview of the revenue side of the equation. And the next would be capital improvements. This is a, a kind of quick hits, um, broad categories, if you will. I will say that you know, one of the things, and it was on an earlier slide, but I failed to, to mention it, um, we have scaled back our, our capital projects significantly, and it has a lot to do with the conversations this council's had about debt and debt load and all those sorts of things. Uh, and so what you see before you, uh, we've really scrutinized and we prioritize as things that we must do or we think we should. Uh, generally speaking, for all the major uh, capital projects, um, they have a leveraging component, whether it's uh, a local match as part of a grant program or a cost share with another <coughs> entity. So we think that they're wise, in, wise investments. Uh, Pleasant Hill Road and Cummings Road uh, are two examples of that. Um, on the equipment side, we're really prioritizing those items that we, we we can't live without at this point, um, and we can. And I expect the finance committee to spend time understanding those needs uh, more directly. Uh, but a lot of the other things that we could push further out and deviate from our equipment replacement schedule, we've done that. <coughs> and then on the school side, it it uh, it shows itself in kind of three areas: technology investments, which is the majority. Then there's facility and maintenance-related CIP items, and uh, transportation, essentially bus purchases as well. And so I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Entwistle just to provide a little com commentary regarding the technology initiative that makes up the majority of their CIP, and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks. Um, I have uh, put on the slide here uh, uh, references to two important documents. They can be found under the news section of the Scarborough Schools website, uh, technology uh, investment proposal for Scarborough High School. There's both a PowerPoint presentation um, and a full uh, proposal document. And um, the costs of developing the one-to-one -one technology capacity for our high school students are reflected in the school CIP, as I said earlier, for FY16. It's important to the note that the cost has been carried in CIP, and uh, the CIP FY16 proposed budget 
um, is uh, is less than uh, that approved for FY15. So we too have had to step back and make some choices. Uh, we've been able to accommodate uh, this uh, expense in CIP by pulling out other facilities uh, related placeholders. Uh, we've made uh, we've done some good planning. We've made some good and fast progress on addressing, for example, uh, building safety and security needs in the previous uh, few years. Uh, you may or may not know that the school board and the school department has completed a comprehensive uh, facility study, a very comprehensive facility study, uh, which will guide us in uh, creating a long-term plan. I believe that, Christine, we believe we're going to be bringing a plan uh, we're going to be bringing a plan uh, to the full board in September. Is that right? Um, or early, early fall. Yeah. Early fall. Um, and uh, we've practiced uh, doing five-year projections. We've done it this year in the current CIP. Uh, but that, uh, uh, those uh, materials and uh, that data will certainly um, help us with a very comprehensive five-year look at facilities needs on the school side um, uh, very soon. And lastly, uh, kind of what does it all mean? Though it's very early in the process, uh, we know the burning question is what does it mean to me and what does it mean to the average taxpayer? And so uh, we do um, uh, take into account uh, this is the, a, a starting point, uh, but we have calculated here what the impact on the average taxpayer would be, a homeowner, and that's a, an average value of $300,000 home. So with a total commitment of uh, $60,800,000 and change, uh, that's money to be raised by property tax, it would require an increase to the rate of $1.28 for a new rate of $16.38. We're currently at $15.10, and that uh, represents an 8.46% increase in the tax rate. And that would calculate to an extra $383 for that average homeowner. Uh, the assumption here is that we add value to the community uh, of $15 million. That number is purposely um, conservative. Um, that, that number is finalized uh, in solely the domain of the assessor. Um, I don't dictate that. The council doesn't dictate that. It is what it is, and it's, it's arrived at uh, in early August. So we'll be adopt you'll be adopting a budget without uh, that full knowledge, but we'll do our best to calculate this impact going forward. This is meaningful for me. I'm not sure if it's all that exciting for anyone else, but this is a chart that shows a little more than 10 years history of three variables. First column is, is uh, valuation. That's the total value of the town. That's an important variable in the tax rate ca calculation. And you'll see we've seen uh, steady growth over that time. Um, that's the good news for us. The bad news is, um, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. We're almost a victim of our own success in that that total valuation number is uh, the primary factor uh, in the state aid to education calculation in the formula. And though our it doesn't look like it's uh, terribly aggressive growth, it's less than 1% or around 1% at most, comparatively speaking to the rest of Maine, frankly, uh, we're outpacing them and, and end up getting penalized by way of that formula and other formulas that use that as a variable. The middle column is the commitment that the amount of money that needs to be raised by property tax to support local priorities. Uh, and the final one is, uh, of course, the tax rate, which is a derivative of those two variables. Tom? Yes. Question, but it, would it, is anything available on what the income levels in Scarborough are? I mean, if you look from 2011 sure. up, it looks like tax rates are more than eating people's paychecks. Is there a way that we can do an income? I don't know, just to kind of put it in context. I, it, certainly, all the demographic data is available, absolutely. I'm not sure if it provides a very clear picture. Uh, there's not necessarily a correlation between household income and ability. Uh, there would be between household income and ability to pay. I suppose, um, but we can certainly provide I that. I mean, I'm just trying to get a picture. I mean, I think what this is showing is where our appetite to spend is far greater than our than our paychecks are increasing collectively, which I think is just something 
at least I'm hearing a lot from our constituents as, as a concern. Well, the, the only variable that the council can control is the middle column, is the commitment, is right. how much we right. need to raise. How much we need to spend. Uh, right. The value takes care of itself. It is what it is, and the tax rate is a mathematical product of the two. Uh, and that middle column is complicated. It's, it's, uh, it's spending. It's taxes shifted from other areas to us. It's all sorts of things that show itself in that number. So quickly, by way of uh, kind of housekeeping, uh, this is a quick picture of the budget review process. Uh, this process has been vetted and worked through by the Town Finance Committee uh, along with the School uh, Board Finance Committee. Uh, so tonight, obviously, is the presentation, the review process. I believe the School Board has a budget workshop coming up on the 3rd. Uh, on, on the town side, uh, the uh, Finance Committee has scheduled four review sessions, uh, and we have scheduled in various departments. So in those four sessions, every department will have uh, appeared before the Finance Committee and, and defended their <coughs> budget proposals. Uh, the last one on April 29th, I say if needed, we don't have any scheduled departments. I suspect uh, the Finance Committee will, in fact, meet and probably do wrap-up and perhaps finalize the recommendations uh, at that time. Uh, the, yes? Uh, I beg your pardon, April 9th. I apologize. And is it here in these chambers? Um, yes. I apologize. I'll correct that before I post uh, this. And then the schedule uh, related to that budget review and adoption process uh, is as follows. So uh, we have scheduled first reading this evening. We have scheduled something new and different this year. We call it a town, high, town hall style Q&A or question and answer, answer period. The intent there, and this is a, an outgrowth directly of this joint process, is to give maybe for the first time, at least in modern history, an opportunity for the public to ask questions and be given answers to the best we can. So I'll have my senior staff, I, I know the superintendent will as well, uh, and the finance committees will be represented at that meeting and we'll do our very best to respond to your questions and provide answers on the spot. That's and at Wentworth, right? We're actually looking at doing it at Winslow Homer Auditorium at the high school. Okay. Um, we think it will accommodate uh, folks okay. better. There will be much, much more uh, publicity around that event coming forward. Okay. Um, moving along, we have scheduled a uh, public hearing for the budget for May 6th. It's a regular council meeting. No. Help me out. Is it a regular council yes. meeting? It yes. is. First meeting in May. Yeah. Uh, there's also a scheduled joint workshop between the full town council and the school board uh, for May 13th. And second and final reading and adoption on May 20. All of that puts us uh, in a position for a uh, school validation vote on June 9. And with that new requirement, we find ourselves kind of working back, arriving at that date and working backward for this process. And it's, it does place some pressures on uh, our internal review timeline and process by virtue of that extra step. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think I can actually predict that uh, the state budget will not be finalized by that by early June. And so depending on how that all shakes out, there may be multiple votes beyond that. And so it's important that we leave a little time on the back end should that be required, and it, it, it may well be required. Uh, perhaps, if only for the benefit of the council, but I, I should just spend two, a few moments just orienting, orienting you to this document. Uh, there is a budget message at the beginning, and I've tried this year to um, be a little more forward-thinking and, and also backward-looking in terms of providing some trend analysis and, again, trying to provide a, a, a deeper story as to what the dynamics are at work. Um, so I encourage you to look at tab one, the budget message. There's a summary analysis <coughs> section that provides very, very big picture information. Tab three, we move into the revenue component. And tab four is the new format that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you'll look that, uh, and see that there's a, an index to help guide you. Um, but this new, more, this new format follows, uh, there is a scheme, I hope, that was the intent. And it's intended to really provide a bit of a story and some, 
some context and background as to what departments do, why they do it, um, and I hope uh, folks find it uh, productive. I need to thank my staff for the yeoman effort they put forward to make this transition. Uh, and just keep in mind, I view it as a work in progress. I think it's something we'll continue to improve upon, but I'm pleased we've kind of made this transition, and I think it can only get better. Moving through the document, tab five is the debt portion. Tab six is capital equipment. Seven is capital projects. This is on the town side. And tab eight is the line item detail of the school budget proposal. And tab nine is a collection of different exhibits. Uh, I mentioned one earlier, um, having exhibit one has to do with the different town positions that, though not funded, I want to make sure you had some detail on those. And I, I really encourage you to take a look at that. And I'll let you look at the other exhibits as well. Uh, and lastly, I have provided the full line item detail, should you feel it necessary. Uh, this is uh, the final tab in the, in the book. Uh, historically, that's been what I've given you, and um, as you might expect, it it, uh, it starts a conversation way down in the weeds as opposed to uh, a bit higher, and that's, that's the intent of all of this. So I thank you for your attention and your patience with the technical difficulties. Uh, this budget will be online by midday tomorrow. We, uh, we'd hope to have it done today, but it will be done late morning uh, or by noon tomorrow. I'll also make that change on the date for the school um, budget meeting uh, and correct my presentation, have that posted as well. Um, do keep in mind, this is early in the process. We do expect changes. We hope to deliver good news as we go forward. Uh, but as professionals, we need to start the conversation with the best information we have. And some of that's not very good right now. This is uh, April 1st, after all. Um, so. Uh, Myself, and I'm sure I can speak for the superintendent, uh, we stand with our staffs ready to support uh, the finance committee and the council as you move through this process and be uh, resources to you. Uh, and I guess the one thing I've learned through this joint um, effort with the school board, though I've known it all along, is that we're all in this together. I mean, we have the luxury of having a school district that represents Scarborough specific. And we need to collectively work through uh, these challenges and find a way out of it. Uh, but we truly are all in this together. So uh, I hope we can continue on the positive, with a positive tone and conversation we've had and collectively find a way to, to identify priorities and, uh, and move forward. I'm certainly pleased to answer any questions you might have. I know it's a lot. <clears throat> Peter. Peter. I guess one thing I struggle with a little bit is understanding. So what we see in front of us in the proposed budget are just sort of the operational expenses. And what I didn't understand. Yes, sorry, sorry. I'm trying to understand the numbers. So what you've proposed are sort of the operational expense. But can you talk a little bit about when you went to the capital improvement plan, which are expenditures for capital items, they're not in this year's numbers per se. They're a future liability, in other words. I mean, it's, it's like a capital improvement project. We're going to buy these things, and they're going to be bonded over time. So the costs really show up downstream, right, in future debt service numbers that will be de So there's really two costs that we're really voting on. One is the operational costs we see, and then two, any capital improvement that we approve will be a cost down the road that are going to be built into our taxes that we can't do anything about. So I think it's just important. So can you talk a little bit about how sure. we should consider uh, that and look at that? As a technical matter, you, but you're, you're actually adopting two separate budgets, the operating budget and a capital budget. So if you look at the budget order on your agenda this evening, the two are broken out. You are right. Generally speaking, most capital items uh, do have a level of long-term financing or, or financing associated, so they are a future cost. Uh, there are others uh, that, though they appear in the capital budget, we actually propose uh, appropriations, so they, they do affect the mill rate. Uh, those are typically the very s the smaller items, lower lower cost items. Um, but it really depends on the nature of the item or the project, frankly. And and really the diff the reason that I think it makes sense to have a, a, a capital budget separate and apart from your general operating budget is. 
uh, if they're combined, there can be huge swings one way or another, and it really makes for difficult um, trending analysis and understanding. And so by separating them, you can kind of isolate and really focus on the operating piece. Uh, yeah. That's the general notion. But, but, but I think my point, I want the audience to know that uh, when they think they were approving. Okay. It's yeah. not time for debate, though. If you have any other questions okay. for, for the presentation about, you know, or any documents or materials, we'll need a motion to have discussion, though. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions from the council about the presentation or any further documents that you might be looking for? Okay. Seeing Thank you. nobody's jumping up and down. So at this point, we'll go ahead and go over to public comment, and then we'll have a motion after that. So is there anybody that wishes to come up and speak on this item? Name, address, and three minutes. Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. Uh, I know that everybody has worked very hard to bring these documents to us tonight. But I have to tell you that I'm going to have a, a lot of difficulty coming up with 383 additional dollars. There are probably a lot of people in this room that could cough that up in a heartbeat. I'm not one of them. I also want to tell you that two of my friends have put their houses up for sale and the sole reason is the rapid increase in taxes. The sole reason. I tend to be oversimplistic about things. I know it's a fault. But in my opinion, the things presented tonight reflect a starting point of I need money for this. And I kind of wonder what would happen if you looked at things a little differently and said the consumer price index raise is 1.7 percent approximately. So that is what I have to spend. Last year's budget plus 1.7 percent. Now, what can I do with that money? That is the way I approach my finances, and I realize that municipal finances and school finances are a little different than my personal ones. But it appears to me that if everyone were to approach it from that view, that budget presentation would be a lot different. I am disappointed. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak on this item? And if you do want to speak on this item tonight, please do just feel free to line right up at the podium. So name, address, and three minutes. My name is Susan Hamill, and I live at 3 Bay Street in, down in Pine Point. 8.46 um, looks like what the mill rate um, is going to change, or what our taxes are going to go up. And I was, you know, it is April 1st, and hopefully it's just an April Fool's joke. But I'm afraid that, it's, that what we're looking at are some serious proposals. And um, I think that we are currently victims of some of our past decisions because um, it sounds like what the story that we're getting is that we don't really have control over a lot of this budget, that it's contracts, that... Well, I'm sorry, but we did agree to those contracts. They are within our control. Those are decisions that we made, that our town made, and they're, they basically are dictating what we need to spend on salaries and benefits. And the other big factor is the debt service that is out of our control once again, and it's going up again. Well, we have decided to spend more money than we actually had. Um, we have almost $100 million in debt right now as a town, and that really uh, limits what we can spend. And um, there are a lot of worthwhile projects. Uh, I think the one-to-one -one, um, technology for the high school students is, I mean, I can't believe we don't have it already. It's embarrassing. It's really, it's something that we absolutely need. But... Um, 
we as a town we can't afford to do everything and we this technology thing didn't come out of nowhere we saw this coming but we chose to spend money on a new school and um, athletics uh, just it, it's just crazy and I, I just don't see how we can keep up with 8.4 percent four six percent increase it's just nuts and um, I think it's uh, you look around and you hear a lot of talk about students coming out of school with uh, out of college with big debt and it they can't buy houses they can't do this and that well we're in the same situation we're a town we spent <coughs> money we didn't have and and now we can't do everything we want and we've got to live with it so thank you my name is Michelle Arpin. I live at 9 Coulthard Farms Road. And um, first, I want to say that um, I want to applaud what seems to be tremendous joint work that was presented here tonight. And for me as a citizen, that was incredibly gratifying. And so I thank all of those involved because for the first time, and I've attended many town council and school, school board meetings around budget time, I've never seen such a joint effort presented here. And that was fantastic. So I thank you and I applaud you for that effort. Um, I will say I left a town council meeting last year right around this time and I went to go pick up my daughter who was in seventh grade at the time from her swim practice and I said to her Caroline I want you to seriously consider a different school for high school I think it's time because it, it, it's bleak every year every year and um, as much as I um, believe in public education, she is making a different choice. She's not attending Scarborough High School next year for a variety of reasons. Um, but I'm excited for her to attend a different school. So like the gentleman who said before that people are moving because they can't afford a taxes, um, I'm making a choice that's tight for my family to send my child to a different high school where she can have opportunities that um, are vastly different than what's being provided by our public um, school here. And, um, you know, I, I'd love to choose to pick up and move and sell my house, but that's not really where we're looking at as a family. So we've made a different choice in sending our child to a different high school. Um, and um, so those are things. And you still get my tax dollars. You're, I'm still supporting this town in that regard. But um, I'd love to be able to say that uh, I'm happily sending her to Scarborough High School, but I'm not. And this was her choice and our choice as a family. So people are making tough choices on all sides of the issue. And um, the fact that... Um, the message out there is that, yeah, we're getting hit hard and we're having to make tough choices as a school system. Um, the cuts are deep and the cuts, cuts are long lasting. And as much as we're all trying to recoup some of those losses over many years of tough budgets, it's just not hitting where it needs to be. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Barney Martin. I live at 17 Foxwell Drive. And I have four children, one who's gone through the school system and three that are still there. There'll be two in high school and one in Wentworth uh, starting in the fall. And I really don't want to be standing here right now. My, the position that I have here regarding the schools is I have only praise. There are some teachers out there that have taken care of my children I see out there already that I just have an amazing relationship with and to support them uh, what do I got to do I'll crawl I, what do you need me to do but I can't lose my job for the sake of my children's education now what's being proposed here is this late start early release stuff every Wednesday next year now in part to be fair is because of what they these teachers need in order to do their jobs I know I, I have professional development at at my company to do my job yes we are given certain amounts of time to to do that kind of thing of course they need that same kind of time and I want them to have that time but I can't lose my job for it um, so I wanted to say that for one to oh so part of the, the solution here 
this you know, brainstorming all kinds of things. But one thing is money allocated to these teachers so they do not have to go after this option. So although there's been some good discussion we had with the school board the other night and there's going to be a lot of different pr proposals I hope that are going to come up. There's going to be more of a collaborative with parents that I personally have not seen in the past. Unfortunately, it's not my first time coming up here lobbying um, against these. They're, they're back when there were four going to seven, going to 14, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> but it's not because I don't support my teachers. I got to tell you, I got vacation time. It's a static amount of time. It's called paid time off. I have to have sick time. Uh, I take my kids to the doctor's time. My car breaks down, whatever that is. That's all I get. And that's against 22 days, roughly, during the calendar year that these kids are, are out of school already. This is not even the early release stuff. 60 days during the summertime. $1,800 for one of my, my children to be a part of the community services. <coughs> I grossed $700 in a pay increase. What's that net? The tax hike that was just proposed tonight alone. Every time we turn around, there's a, there's a fundraiser here, a fundraiser there. You want to support all these things. Um, Would you please wrap up your three I'll try to wrap up. Thank okay. you. Uh, but when you're paying for sports, you're paying for, for literature club now. I mean, we're, we're paying for everything. It's crazy. My employee just simply is not going to be tolerable to my personal needs. It's about their business. And if I can't be there, I already had an adjustment five years ago. Okay? I was <laughs> if you've seen the job market out there, the economy is not what it is. It's just, I don't know, if you think it's thriving out there, it's nothing like the 90s. And I'll tell you, in, in the 90s, even that would have not been tolerated at all to be out that amount of time. And the reason why they're doing it now is because they need this kind of quality time for their education. So I understand um, the needs that are going on here, but I don't think I'm the only one that has a two-parent uh, working family around here and that these proposals coming from the school because of what their needs are are going to put us either in further financial debt or, like what's being proposed out here, do we have to consider to move? Do I have to consider my child to go somewhere else? We love Scarborough. I don't want to go anywhere. I came here in the early 90s. I'd like to stay. But we've got to work this out better. This, this, something's broken. And I don't know enough about things to really get into details, but I just wanted to share that with you in terms of a personal story with me. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jane M. I'm a member of the school board, but here's a comment I'm going to make. is completely personal. It's something that I feel, so it doesn't represent what the board, you know, as a, um, as a whole. And I think I took me a year and a half really on this school board position to really figure out, you know, what are we are really doing here? You know, it's learning progress. And uh, all this email, yes, we see a lot of email this year against, uh, you know, how much we are spending, all that stuff. I did have a finance background. I thought I come to the school, uh, school board, I can, you know, try to see how, make sure we spend the money efficiently, you know, we use the scarce resources and hope, you know, I didn't like my taxes to be raised and I was paying, you know, uh, we are getting raised every year. But suddenly I think what, sud you know, really hit me is the superintendent job, you know, looking at this budget is propose a budget that good for a student, good for the school district. He's supposed to use this resources he is provided every year most efficiently. His, I think it's not in his job description he says, I, my job is to cut certain positions, reduce the budget spending by $2 million. If our school board employ a superintendent like that and reward a superintendent like that, I think his job going to be have kind of a conflict of interest. Which one do you, that he value? school student performance or they're using less money, how we are going to judge him. So right now I think school 
superintendent job is say, you know what, I need to focus on education, do what's good for the kids. And you know, show us he's accounted for how the school is performing. As a school board member, I was, when I came up to there, I didn't know. I thought I was just like you. Uh, you know, the servant is, you know, everybody in the town, and i supposed to listen to everybody. And then when I come here, and the first day I feel like hit on the head, I feel, you know what? I'm only supposed to serve the kids. That's my top. I mean, of course, we need to think about how we use the money as a whole society. But our school board members are here to consider how we provide sufficient funds for the students. So we oversee how the school is managed. So how to do our job? So some people say we are spending too much money and we are living out of our means. The fact is we have surplus every year. That means we don't spend all the money we are given to. We actually live, do live under our means. We just <coughs> accept whatever the town council, the voters give to us. And whatever it is, you know, so really those uh, comments towards us is, you know what, we try to do our best, provide this, this, this what we think needs to be, and the town council, the voters, give us what you guys think we should have. But please remember, we are here to make the town more prosperous, the students have a better future, and that's what our job. So people talk about Windworth a lot. It's a sum cost. It's not the current school board member or the superintendent problem. We, yes, it's a beautiful, it's a, for, but it's really not part of our day-to-day -day operation decisions. And it was voted by some, so that we, we appreciate the sum has given us so much support. However, going forward, if we're not going to support, of course we're going to suffer. But it's our, we have to do our best to ask everybody, please support us. You know, if you say anybody wants to move, everybody is a free country. We all can move. You know, just like the lady Dyer said, she's sending her kids to another school. And if somebody says, the tax rate of 1.5%, I cannot pay because I have big housing or property, well, maybe you need to think about, are you living under your means? Because your tax... Ms. Light, well, we're actually over okay. three minutes. <laughs> Once it's approved by the taxpayers or the town council, it is your job to live under your means, not really, you know, our decision. You have to decide what you want to do. So, I mean, so if we, you know, we... I think in certain ways, if we love this town and want to live here, well, we have to say what the town asks for, what's best for the town, we're going to do it. If this is approved by the voters, we are going to say that's what we are going to have to pay. But if you don't say, oh, I'm going to move because of school, because of taxes, well, maybe you have the freedom. You know, Maybe it's good for somebody to move because you know what? The market gets better when everybody, you know, do them what's good for them, and maybe it's better for for Scarborough if everybody do what's better for him. And I, that's what I choose to do too. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, just a friendly note. So we are going to activate our lovely little go light up there at the podium <laughs> with its green, yellow, and red. And I believe the yellow is like, yellow is like, start wrapping up. Yeah. Okay. Is your one minute warning? So Got it. Name and address, please. I see the three minutes and it's going. Drew Stevens, 6 Surrey Lane. And hopefully I won't need three minutes. Um, I just also want to reiterate what someone already mentioned about the working together between the um, finance committee um, on the town council and the school board working together on that. I think, I think this is my fourth or fifth year now where I've been going through everyone sitting in here arguing about the school budget and it's a pretty hostile environment as I think you've noted. Um, and I think this is the right way to do it is get it started earlier and start some serious discussion. Um, keeping in mind that it's all about what's best for our children and 
whether you have children that live in Scarborough or not, I think we'd all agree that that's what's best for the town of Scarborough, is doing what's best for the children. So um, we moved here to Scarborough eight years ago because of the schools. That was one of the major, major reasons why um, on a regular basis I meet people that moved to Scarborough. The reason they brought up why they moved to Scarborough, a major reason is because of the schools. And I know that there's a lot of time and thought that went into doing the school budget. Um, it's not that they're sitting around saying, hey, let's spend a bunch of money. And I know you know this, but I think I'm on camera, so someone's going to see this at some point. It's not they're willy-nilly throwing out a bunch of numbers saying, hey, let's spend a bunch of money on our schools. They're sitting there looking at what it's going to take for our kids to have a good education. We know what it costs for sand and for salt. We don't know what it costs to teach a third grader multiplication. It's, it's something that we have. I have. My kids are right now in second grade and fourth grade. I have principals and teachers of my children in the room right now. We've done an amazing job with our kids. And we can't keep cutting every single year saying, do more with less. Do more with less. We're going to take care of those potholes. We're getting new infrared cameras. We're doing all kinds of things to make our town a better place to live. Investing in our schools and our children is the best investment we can make. Thank you. He still has 40 seconds left, so do I get to add that to my <laughs> <laughs> I try to do that to lighten up the room. <laughs> Hi, my name's Amy Chamberlain. I live on uh, Ryefield Drive. And I'm like Drew. I've gone back and forth between Saco and, and Scarborough and made sure I moved back to Scarborough as soon as my kids were able to go to kindergarten. And very happy to see um, the people that are here and that are on the staff and also their town council uh, have worked very hard. I think this year you should all be, as we teachers do say to pat yourself on the back because it doesn't happen very often because you have worked together. And that is one of the hardest things to do, especially with this town who, in my opinion, has decided to support more on sports um, and show more support for pets. And I'm not trying to upset people. Please let that be known. I feel we need to really start looking at our education and why we have been throwing down the budget for our poor school department. Our teachers are on bare bone minimal. And I can tell you that from experience. You're going to walk into a classroom, and what you see in those classrooms, 70 to 80% of what's in that classroom come from the teachers, comes from their pockets, comes from donations of parents like myself saying, I'm not teaching anymore. Here you go. Here are my reading books. Here's my, you know, my curriculums, everything I've worked on for years. We need to start showing our children we support them, whether they are kindergarten or high school. It's really, really upsetting to me that we keep turning down these budgets for these teachers, for the staff, and we give everybody a hard time about it, but nobody's up here fighting for them. I feel like also our representatives that we voted in in this town need to start doing their job up there in Augusta. I used to do advocating in New Hampshire. I'm getting ready to get up there. I'm not teaching full time. I'm a stay home mom now. That wasn't my choice. I was hurt at work. I can't go back to work. So with that, I've decided to stay home and help my children. But by helping my children in my town, I'm helping their education and hopefully someday my grandchildren's education. And I really think you need to think about that as opposed to $383 for the $300,000 value of a home. I live in one of those homes. I'm not saying I want to pay it, but I know why I need to pay it and why I should pay it. I'm not upset with anybody who can't afford it. Maybe the town, maybe some people need to start helping and looking out for programs for them. But we need to do it for our children because it is for us in the long run, especially when, become, I become, excuse me, when I become older. I want to be taken care of like my children, and that's why I'm here. I'm their first advocate, and I always will be, even if I'm going to be the one nobody wants to listen to. So thank you for your time. My name is Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. 
My husband and I are both born and bred in Scarborough. We've lived here all our lives. I have, we have four children um, in the school system, two seniors, a sophomore, and an eighth grader. I, I think it goes without saying that, of course, we want to support our teachers and all the great work that they do. That's an understatement. But the fact is, um, once again, I, I noticed that on the uh, very first slide, one of your goals is to have a stable tax rate. And I just don't see how that can be if every year it goes up and up and up. You're killing me. It's killing me. Another $383. I don't have that money. I don't know where I'm going to get that money. And I don't want to move. This is my town. I don't want to move. My kids don't want to move. My husband doesn't want to move. I used to feel like I would tell my kids, do really good in school and um, go to college and get a good job. And I feel like, and, and I know I'm not the only one because I talk to a lot of my friends, and now the goal is get a job for the town, work for the town. You get great pay. You never get a pay cut. You'll never be laid off. You get raises and you get great benefits. That's not right. I can tell you where I work, I have to pay for my benefits. And if I'm a smoker, I have to pay more. If my blood pressure is high, I have to pay more. If my BMI is too high, I have to pay more. That's one way we could get some of our insurance covered. I know that for the town you said there's going to be a 5% increase. Does the do, the do the workers in the town have to pay more? I, I would like to know that answer because I think the way I'm assessed at work, I have to pay more for, for those various things. My health condition and, and my spouse. My spouse has to take a blood test. He has to take a urine test. He has to get a physical. And if he doesn't meet up to those specific guidelines, we have to pay more. I think that's a great idea for the town members to have to participate in their health care more. That would be a great savings. Um, and I guess the other thing I could say is to follow the motto of the D.A.R.E. program in this town. Just say no. I know every time you ask the school budget, the school board, please don't come to us with an increase. And they come to you with an increase. The firemen, the policemen, I love those guys. Who doesn't? I want them to have all their stuff. But they come to you every year with more. We need to hire more policemen, more firemen. Great. And now we need a bigger building. It's a domino effect. I think at some point, the town council really needs to put their foot down and say, when we mean no, we actually really mean it this year. And we're not going to take an increase in any of these budgets. I urge you to just say no. Thank you. Hello, my name is Betsy Gleistein. I'm from Longmeadow Road. Um, I never thought I would be up here. It's definitely not easy to come and talk. Um, what got me interested in the school budget this year is the proposed school calendar. If you've not been um, up on that issue, there have been five separate proposals put forth for um, increasing professional development time um, for teachers without increasing instructional time. and. Uh, this is just one example from the high school. Um, and this, this represents two of the proposals, a draft one proposal and a revised draft proposal. And it shows um, at the top the decrease in instructional time for high school. And the bottom uh, section shows the increase that the um, administration is asking for increase in professional development. And so I guess the reason I came tonight is because there's a increase being requested, a large increase being requested, and there's many good reasons were given. Uh, it was very difficult to digest that presentation. I called and asked for a copy of the school board budget, I believe Monday or Tuesday, and they said they don't give it out. I guess I would recommend that in the future that all of these budgets um, are required to be in at least two days early so we can see them, personally download them and print them. It's very hard to digest based on, you know, what just watching and seeing where the 
increases actually are and being able to speak intelligently to this. Um, but to see a, a large increase and then to know that my students are going to have instructional time decreases, it's very disturbing to me. Um, and in terms of the laptops, uh, you know, I might be um, in, in the minority, um, but I would love to see um, not just a Q&A on the 29th. I guess I don't understand what's going to happen in those 28 days, but I'd love to see a subcommittee, a group get together and talk about these high school one-to-one -one laptops. You're talking about kids that walk around with $1,000 smartphones. Um, you're talking about laptops that get obsolete. We're talking about an almost million-dollar capital project, which my understanding was have to, has to be approved by the by the voters because it's over 400000 and that's in the charter. And then how is it capital if it's expendable resources? And what else has been explored, you know, and what are the projects people are going to do with these? And I, I would love to be involved in that situation. I've been in IT, in that discussion, I've been in IT for 32 years. Um, and I, I hope that we do have a lot more dialogue around the laptop issue as well. And I probably would have a lot more questions and commentary if I were able to have dug into the, the budget ahead of time. But I was here tonight because of my major concern about an increase in school spending and a decrease in instructional time. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Alec Mabaduk. I live on uh, Bayberry Lane as well. I guess the gentleman's left um, here in Scarborough. Uh, and uh, I think, first of all, I just want to thank you for all the work everybody's done on this. I feel like you guys are in a very difficult uh, position um, trying to meet the needs of students and taxpayers. Um, I feel like, you know, part of the pro you guys are experiencing a problem that um, is not entirely of your making. Um, the, you know, property taxes are not an ideal form of taxation to pay for uh, things. They, you know, can hurt folks on the lower end of uh, the income scale than many other taxes. Um, we have an abundance in wealth in Maine, um, and you know there's uh, income taxes, estate taxes that could be a much for much fairer form of looking at how to fund a lot of these critical services. Um, and at the same time, as you're being limited in the decisions that you're able to make to pay for these things, you're also facing. Uh, an ever decreasing share from the state on education costs. I think the governor's budget I've seen, um, would bring us down to about 45% of uh, education costs being shared uh, uh, by the state when it's supposed to be 55% is my understanding. Um, I don't know if folks have seen similar information to that, but uh, you know, I find that just incredibly disturbing that voters said, you know, we want the state to pay for 55% of education costs. If they were actually doing their job and doing that, we probably would not be having this conversation at all today. Um, so I think that's a really important point. I hope it's one um, that we impress upon um, you know, our delegation and hope that they are able to get us closer to that 55% to sort of you know, either stop or come up with better solutions uh, to uh, the ever decreasing amount of revenue sharing coming from the state. Um, uh, but all that being said, to me, uh, when I saw the $383 amount um, that came up for the $300,000 house, that's not terribly different from my uh, current situation with the house that I own on Bayberry Lane. Um, and I, I thought it seemed pretty you know, reasonable in the grand scheme of things and that there's not a lot of things in there that I would take much of an issue with. So not having been able to dive into it uh, very deeply. But I will say that I think um, I'd like to actually echo the remarks um, uh, somebody before me said in that, you know, one of, I think, the reasons that I did move to Scarborough was that I know that the school system is a huge attraction to the area, you know, for people who want to move to Scarborough. I don't personally have kids in the school system. I don't plan to have kids in the school system. Um, but even all that aside, it's an important investment for me because I I also probably won't live in Scarborough forever, and I would like to be able to sell my house um, and even be able to take some money out of it and to go out and buy a, a better house. And a lot of that has to do with whether or not um, we have a school system that's going to attract people here and sending, instead of sending them to Cape Elizabeth or some of the other surrounding towns like Falmouth that also have that as an attraction point. So those are my two cents. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? 
All right, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. And is there... Hmm? Yeah. Um, a motion? Approval. Second. And discussion. What? Nobody wants to talk about it? Come on. Who wants to go first? Who wants to go first? Everybody jump right in. I, I guess I guess I could I can share. I mean I, I guess right. Peter? I guess what concerns me if if we where we started at the top of the conversation were some of the tenets we put up about what we wanted to achieve. One is recognize our physical constraints, um, trade off conversations, making tough choices about things we need to do, <coughs> the resources that we have, and then it's already been mentioned a couple times tonight from the audience about does this resu result in a stability to our tax rate? And I, and I think all three of those things, if we look at this budget, um, I'm not sure we've achieved that. So I have some concerns. And I, I kind of, and I'll, I'll take the time to applaud if you look at the municipal budget and you look at what the net net increase is, is virtually a flat increase. It's 0.35%. What's driving all the increase that we're seeing, the majority of the increase is the school budget. So I would like to take a little more time to understand that before we move forward. Anybody else? Jim Marie? Um, as always, I would just remind folks at home that these are proposed budgets. These aren't final figures. This is, we're just making a presentation at this point of what we think our needs are and what we think the costs will be. It now goes through a very, pretty long process for the whole month of April. It goes to um, our finance committee. And the finance committee will be meeting with the various department chairs and looking for places to save money. I know as a counselor, when I first saw the numbers, I flipped myself. Um, I mean, that, it, it's a huge increase. Um, we are under a lot of different pressures. I, I know I sound like a, I keep repeating this and repeating this and repeating this, but we also need to be talking to our legislative delegation. And I'm glad I heard that from a few people who spoke tonight, because uh, the state is doing a huge tax shift on us, uh, which is negatively impacting us as property taxpayers in Scarborough. And I don't think that's fair, because uh, as everyone knows, property taxes are regressive and are not based on your ability to pay, but are based on how much your house is worth. And as our last speaker said, he likes to be in Scarborough because we have good property values in Scarborough, and I happen to know that because of my business I'm in. Uh, but that being said, um, I, I, want, I hope that people in town continue to send us emails, come to meetings. Uh, this is going to be the big question and answer forum, town meeting style on April 29th. People can come with specific questions. Please pay attention uh, to what's going on. This is the beginning of the dialogue. It's not the end. <laughs> That's all I have to say. And does anybody do. else? I have some. Okay. I'll go. Um, uh, you know, I have to agree with some of the, a few of the things that my fellow counselors have said. Um, this is always a, a tricky time for me. I have numerous children in the school district. Um, I can easily look out into the crowd and see people that, uh, educators that I know love my kids and will do anything for them and have done things for them. Um, so my, my heart always wants to give them everything and anything they could possibly need to help continue to do that. Um, then I have to flip and turn around and be a counselor um, and read the, I would say, 100 emails that we get during this time from residents that genuinely cannot afford their taxes to go up. And I feel like every year we say, we're not going to do this. We're gonna, we've got to stop this. We have to rein this in. And every year, we don't. Um, and so it's, it's a really frustrating process. I, I'm concerned. I don't feel like I've had enough time to you know, go over the school budget. Um, I agree with the woman that stood up and spoke. I think it should be, um, it should be out to the public before so people have a chance to look at it. Um, I don't think anything should ever be hidden. Um, you know, we're working on transparency, and um, I applaud our, our finance group, who has really worked really hard at that this year. I have a lot of faith in, in Sean's group. 
Um, and I also want to commend the school finance committee and our finance committee for working so hard together this year. There, I mean, let's be frank, there has been some, some rough years between the two boards. And I think that between these two groups, they've really been able to sort of overcome some of those things. And that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, we have to be working together. That's the only way we're going to make this happen. Um, I, I think that, I think I'm going to wrap it up from at that point. The, the, I guess the last thing I want to say is, um, like Jean Marie, um, Councillor Katarina said, this is the beginning, this is the beginning numbers, this is just the start. Um, I will, uh, there is, I will not support a budget in the, what, from what we saw tonight. I can tell you, I have no problem saying that. And I say that with the backup of this is the beginning and this is the start. And I, I understand what you're saying, um, where your business is to be concerned about the students, and my business is to be concerned about the students and everybody else in this town. So that is a very difficult position to be in. So I think we have to remember that. Anybody else want to comment? Any? Bill? For me, I've got to reconcile uh, two fundamental issues. One, uh, <clears throat> public education is the cornerstone of our country. Mm -hmm. It is the cornerstone. It is the highest priority that we have as far as public spending. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, and yet we are a town made up of many people uh, who have limitations. Uh, and it's impossible to expect uh, ourselves individually or the seven of us plus the town manager to have budgets that are not predictable <clears throat> and dependable. You just can't do that. It's, it's essential that we can commit to something reasonable each year. Some people say it's CPI, COLA. Uh, well, <coughs> who's to say what that is in this circumstance? But that's, that's what I have as a bigger picture in trying to reconcile uh, where to end up on this budget. I'll look for solutions uh, in big or small ways all the way as a part of the Finance Committee, uh, and that will take a lot of work. But in the end, it will come down to deciding what's fair to everybody here. Thank you. John? Thanks. Um, first, um, tonight's action is simply the starting point of a very long process. In fact, um, we have scheduled uh, 10 meetings between now and April 22nd to review the entire budget through the Finance Committee in which um, Mr. Hall and the department heads as well as uh, the school board and Dr. Adam Twistle will be presenting the, really the line item detail um, to some extent, not necessarily down to the weeds, about what they're requesting for. So I'm, I'm going to be reserved for now about um, where that all is because I do need to um, digest a very lengthy document um, to be, make an educated decision. Um, what I do want to say is um, to both Mr. Hall and Dr. Antwistle is to thank you. Your presentation really, to me, encapsulates, encapsulates a process by which we really started out to build a relationship. And our school board's finance committee, the town council's finance committee, has really worked very hard on that. And we still have a lot of work to do um, together to do um, what we need to do for you as citizens. Um, on April 29th, we are having a public forum about our budgets in which we will present and do a Q&A, which is unprecedented, at least in the 15 years that I've been around, um, often on the council and even on the school board. Um, so I'm very excited about that because it will be another opportunity. We'll probably know more and understand more by then because um, I know that there is at least one proposal in the town's budget um, that I supported originally that I believe I'm changing my mind on. Um, <laughs> Thanks to a few phone calls uh, for <laughs> a few door knocks. So. <laughs> a few door knocks and uh, a lot of angry neighbors about trash bags. Um, Some fellow so, um, you know, this is an evolving process. And I'll be honest with you, um, even in the trash bag program, I'm 100% in favor of the program. But the fact is, is that um, I don't always get what I want either. <laughs> uh, just don't tell my wife. Hopefully she's not listening. Um, so it, it is about compromise. It's about understanding um, <coughs> what 
what our boundaries and limitations are, and it's about moving that forward. Um, and so uh, I do hope that everyone um, stays involved, um, keeps asking the questions, because we are going to listen and we will take action. Um, you know, and, and to everyone's comments, um, I did want to mention, you know, for some reason, um, it seems that the public's interest in finance is um, what I'll call selective outrage. Um, they're selectively outraged because of local taxes going up. But yeah, we have a legislative delegation that isn't helping us at this time. And I'm going to be blunt about that. Yep. I mean, we lost $1.1 million in state funding for our um, schools. In addition to that, um, you know, there was a bill, LD60, which uh, restored funding for retirement teachers, in which both of our House delegates <coughs> voted in the minority, 119 to 27 to kill that. Mm -hmm. And our state senator, one of our state senators, actually was the deciding vote in the Senate to also kill it. Right. That would have returned $560,000 back to this community, and we didn't get the help. That's right. So I don't mind taking the blunt of the outrage at the local level. But you know what? It's about time we share that at every level, and that includes Amen. at the state. So I hope that you join me in expressing that disappointment because it's there. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to working with everybody, and um, it's going to be an interesting trip. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. And any other? Ed. Um, I'm beginning to wonder whether we should be voting on this tonight. Uh, and primarily the reason is that uh, neither one of the finance committees has really sat down and reviewed the budget that was presented. Um, what was presented by the town, uh, 0.3, percent increase is admirable. What was presented by the, the school, uh, pretty high. Um, and I certainly can't support uh, an 8.46% increase in the tax rate. It's outrageous. Can't do that. Um, therefore, I, I believe that the, uh, the corresponding um, finance committee should sit down and quickly review this and come back uh, at our next meeting and we'll have our first vote then. That's how I feel about it. Any other comments? Bill? No? Well, this is first reading uh, yeah. and I think people should understand that uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, to move this forward to a public hearing and a second reading is not a reflection of, I think, any of our attitudes about where we're going to end up with this budget. It's a process. Okay. And I'm prepared to vote for uh, this tonight to move the process forward. Doesn't mean that that's what I'm going to support, because at this point, I totally agree with Ed's comment that I'm not going to support an 8%. It's well, well beyond the ability of the average person in this community to uh, bear that kind of increase. Jimmy. Uh, um, I also, uh, um, with all due respect to uh, Councillor Blaze, <laughs> um, I agree. What we're doing here is we're just putting the budgets forward to begin the process of where we're going to end up. I don't like the numbers either. I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for the budget the way it's written right now. But we're not voting for the budget as it's written right now. This is the first reading to put it into process so that we can continue to work on it so that we can have something that comes out for a final vote on May 20th. So there's a lot of time, a lot of water over the dam between now and then, so. Can I say something real quick? Um, well, he beat you. Oh, that's he okay. Did. Go ahead. He did. Right. He was quicker. He's yeah. quicker. <laughs> um, I, I, we're very clear on, you know, what the process is. I think, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think the issue is um, for a couple years in a row, you know, this has, this is the process, this is how it goes, this is how it happens. Um, and I think that I personally feel like before I put my name to anything, I want more time with this. So I can see why Councillor Blaze is asking to table this for this meeting. Um, I, I think regardless of where it stands, what reading it is, we owe it to the people to know exactly what we're voting on pushing it forward or not. And I mean, I understand the process. I get it. 
been doing it for a couple years, and that's why I have a hesitation that I feel pretty strongly that whenever I'm voting on something, I don't know exactly what it is, what is in, what's in front of me, and I don't feel like I do tonight. So, any other comments? Yeah, I guess I, and I guess I would echo that I, I would feel much more comfortable as long as it still accommodates the timeline that we table this tonight, we let the finance committees meet, we come back, and I think there's a meeting scheduled for the 14th for both a finance committee and a town council meeting where we could come back and take it up then, but at least then there's an ability to work through some of this conversation and partnership and determine if there's any opportunities to, to fine tune the number. I, I just feel uncomfortable moving on it tonight. I think there's, I, I'd rather get everybody to be comfortable with the information. I don't think it slows down the timeline. So I would, I don't know if that's a motion to table it tonight and bring it back on the 14th. Well, let me add my 10 cents. Usually I try to wait and, and let everybody talk first, but but there, we might be heading for a motion. So give, give, me, give me a moment. Um, I don't have an issue mo moving first reading because first reading doesn't mean anything other than you're starting the process. And what happens here is finance does take each department. I know Sean is handling that a little differently and more uniquely. But not only is Sean looking with the finance committee, which is going to be um, Bill Donovan and, and Peter Hayes this year, um, comes to second reading with a series of recommendations for every proposal. And I do want to reiterate that these are proposals. That's all they are. They are not what we are doing. I am not giving my approval to it other than I am giving the approval to start the process and allow Finance Committee to do its work. Uh, it also starts the process of knowing, because let's face it, they're sitting in front of us. They know what this discussion is. They know we're not happy with the number and we're not in a position to be able to support it and maybe they'll have to rethink some of their proposals, or maybe they'll have to look to some outside concepts like the council has done with shared services with PD and assessing and some of the, you know, maybe there's some opportunities for them with adult education. I don't know. And the reality of that is it's not a number that we as a council, we can't tell them how to manage and what to move those proposals. So to me, this is just moving the full process forward allowing finance committees to work together to reevaluate those proposals and come back with a recommendation in second reading. There is no action at public hearing. So again, the action comes at second reading. Um, so there's that. Um, oh, and how we deliver trash, actually. You will be exploring that this year and how we deliver our trash service and our programming. And if we as a community and as a council still want to cover the full cost of there's a hall fee, there's a tipping fee, there, you know, how we deliver our services. I'm looking to hear from the finance committee a little bit of, of, of what some of those ideas might be. Um, again, going to hammer that these are proposals. They are not definites. The budget, as I asked Tom earlier, will be uploaded tomorrow onto the town's webpage. And back to me delivering thoughts. $345 is unacceptable. Mm. So there's my, my out the gate statement. Because I know uh, coupled with that is the $150 approximately plus or minus hit that somebody's going to get if they lose their homestead exemption. So now you bring a total of that's what I know is going out and I can't support that. Right. It doesn't mean I don't support education. I have two kids in those systems. I have kids that benefit from some of the extra help that are in those systems. And it doesn't mean I care any less about anybody else's kid. Those systems need to be there. But in the same token, I and I, and I hear this argument time and time again, well, everybody's paid for somebody's kid at some point. I defy you to find an era where the increases have been to the pace that they have been within the last five years. Mm -hmm. Our increases have completely and utterly outpaced retirement and retirement plans and, and, and those sorts of things. So even the best planning wouldn't have saved you right now. And that's the problem. We do have to factor in that X factor because also there is a factor that happens in Scarborough. 
if you sell a house as a senior citizen, it's likely not another senior citizen. It's going to be more kids coming into a system that's already an issue. So it's important to our dynamic to preserve the balance mm -hmm. of those. So again, I, I don't have an issue moving this forward tonight. I, I, I plan on giving my support to it. it. Does not mean it has my support as a package, and I will be looking to hear those recommendations from finance. So. Now that you've had my 10 cents too, is there anybody else? Can I just say one more thing? Um, I know, I'm on the rules tonight. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess the, the other thing, I know I mentioned this, but I want it after hearing, and I agree with a lot of what, of what you said, and I appreciate what you said. Um, one of my issues with a lot of things overall is that, is, is the public being able to see this stuff, and we're going to have it uploaded tomorrow, and I'm voting on something tonight that nobody's seen and so that's just where I, I I struggle with that piece of it and I want to support it because I like to see things keep moving and I don't want to disrupt that process but I I have issues with us being I know everybody hates me saying this but more transparent and that to me is not getting this out for the public to see it and we're voting on it and I know it's just pushing it forward, and it's just the first reading. To me, it's just a feeling that I have. So I just felt I needed to say that. <coughs> I'm done. I think it was Sean. Then you can go. Uh, thank you. Um, so if, if my recollection is correct, I believe that typically in the past, the council has generally submitted, or I should say the manager has submitted his budget um, to the council in one meeting, and then actually the first reading and public hearing um, is the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So if we were to table this to the next meeting, it's not necessarily inconsistent with prior practices. And um, if, if that's what you want, I would be more than happy to support that, as long as it achieves something. And um, the fact is that we don't have any other public meeting in which all of us can share where we want this budget to go. So the Finance Committee, which is only a, a minority of this group, uh, three members, really do not understand, or at least I don't understand, where you want us to be in moving that forward because none of the presentations have been made to justify what the requests have been. So for me, if we don't approve this, it's hard for the Finance Committee to move forward um, with those presentations because I don't know where to then guide the rest of the committee, let alone the managers and their staff, in the presentation if it could fall apart at the first reading, which is after, I think, six or seven of the presentations. So. I would prefer if we actually approve the first reading this evening so that we at least have a baseline um, and then I can gauge where we go from there. Otherwise, we just simply really have a blank piece of paper to then move the committee forward. And to me, it doesn't seem like we achieve a whole lot. It's hard for me to be able to give you anything, though, when I'm just getting this. So I can't tell you, let's cut X, Y, and Z because... I'm just getting this for now, and I have no public input either. So do you see what I mean? Like, I totally get what you're saying, but it's hard for me, when this is our only forum, for me to give you anything to do because I I'm just getting this. So I, I understand your point, but I hope you can see mine. I'm not used to a council having this going back and forth thing, so I, well, I'm, I'm sorry. For the chairwoman I, to either recognize me or uh, well, I, uh, I'm she fine. can. I, I, can I know. I understand it. It's just I needed to. I know it's. I'm out of line, and, and certainly I'm all, done. Um, and certainly, I do hope. Um, I'm going to cut you off. I know you had your hand raised for a little while, Bill. Um, I apologize. I do want to point point out that, and I hope to encourage the other councilors to do attend the, the finance committee meetings. Each one will be with each individual department. Those are also open to the public, and I do believe as well get uploaded to the town's website. Yes, they will be. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> they will be. Um, it, it's important that we all, you know, take the time to, even, even though the Finance Committee is its own committee and, and we'll need to have the dialogue, but it's important for all of us to try to, if you can't attend, at least catch them online. So at least you can hear um, from the individual departments, you know, why they're requesting. Each department, as the school said, advocates for what their needs are. You know, it, the school advocates for the kids. The fire department advocates for what they think they need to do to maintain public safety. So at least the benefit of hearing why the proposal is the way, they, the way it is. So um, somebody was, was it Donovan? <laughs> I, uh, the idea of delaying this vote for two weeks 
<clears throat> I don't want to set up an expectation that I'd be in a position as a finance committee member <clears throat> to be making judgments or recommendations because we would, it's almost two months before we get to that stage. Mm -hmm. So I, I respect the process that this is a starting point and it's not an acknowledgement of an acceptance of the budget. It's simply a vote to move things forward. That's all it is. And I wouldn't want anyone to think that we would come back having voted to delay the first reading vote for two weeks and that we would be in a position to actually make a recommendation to anybody as to exactly where to go with this budget. Mm -hmm. Oh, is there any other discussion or would somebody like to offer a motion? There's already a motion on the floor. That's great. <clears throat> oh, well, I was thinking the amendment, but all right. So if nobody else has anything to say, um, all those in favor? And that would be one, two, three, four, five. And all those opposed, we have two. That's a vote. On to item nine, standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. And, well, we can start with you, Councillor Babine, but I think we know what you're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I just want to reiterate four dates that uh, was in the manager's uh, presentation. Those dates are April 8th. Um, it's a Wednesday. Um, April, uh, Tuesday, April 14th, Wednesday, April 22nd. All of those meetings for the town's finance committee to discuss the budget um, presentations from the department mm -hmm. uh, chairs and directors are from 4 to 6 p.m. I believe, Tom, um, is that available online as far as which uh, departments are meeting at what time? Or can we make that available? It's part of the budget document. It's actually inside the front cover. Okay. You'll see the schedule. Yep. Um, and then lastly is a reminder on uh, April 29th, uh, which is a Wednesday at 7 p.m. at the, at the um, high school auditorium, there is a public forum on the budget presentation that uh, Mr. Siazzo, uh, school board finance chair, and myself will be making along with the manager, superintendent, and their senior staff. And that is an open forum for all citizens. Um, and uh, last but not least, I just wanted to mention, um, it's kind of a committee, I, I've never really spoken on this, um, I'm also the school liaison, school board liaison, and I just wanted to mention that I will be attending tomorrow evening for um, a brief uh, session to, um, to, um, to speak with them, but if any of you have any issues or anything that you'd like me to uh, get information or share with them, please uh, share it with me and I'll be happy to communicate that tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, I've been attending, of course, the Finance Committee meetings. Uh, uh, Council Baybine has been uh, running them. We've had a very successful series of meetings uh, with uh, the county representatives to understand where their budget uh, uh, situations are uh, with a, a paper bag uh, a concept that seems very controversial. But I think in today's world, as we saw almost every speaker uh, uh, pronounce we need to find ways to save money uh, and it represents a way to save money and therefore uh, I'm going to look at it I have way too little information at the present time to, to judge it uh, attended the US Fish and Wildlife Service meeting mm. uh, 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 at which I was very pleased to see the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, uh, temper their uh, uh, views towards Scarborough very uh, uh, laudatory about the efforts that we've made and the success that they recognize we've achieved uh, with the issues related to uh, piping plovers and that was uh, that was good because the council as a whole put a lot of effort into trying to get to a place that we could uh, uh, satisfy uh, different factions in the town <coughs> Thank you. excuse me it me um, there's a long-range planning committee meeting uh, Friday at 8 a.m. We'll be looking at uh, long-term facilities planning for all <coughs> municipal facilities to come up with, you know, timelines and uh, ideas about um, when things may need to be improved, upgraded, or whatever. Um, we're also going to be looking at Haggis Parkway, we had a meeting with uh, some of the businesses and the landowners down there. There's a, been a proposal to amend um, the contract zone, which I know Jessica loves to hear about. 
mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to add food processing um, to a section of the Haggis Parkway. And when we talk about food processing, it's not like the old days when you used to have these stinky fish plants and whatever around, but things like breweries and uh, small batch breweries and small batch food processing and whatnot um, is an intriguing idea, and I know we've been approached by several businesses uh, on that, so we're, we're looking at that as part of long-range planning. Uh, I will be attending the uh, Legislative Policy Committee for the Maine Municipal Association next Wednesday in Augusta. It's been an interesting session, to say the least. We have a number of bills that come through. Uh, there are about 100 of us, there are town managers, selectmen, selectmen, town councilors, city councilors, whatever. It's very interesting. It's a great way to meet others who are in positions like myself. Um, but we decide on what bills we're going to support, not support, and we do some lobbying, so to speak, with our local legislators. Not all of them listen, but that's okay. We try. Um, so that will be next Wednesday. And then the Conservation Commission did not meet in March, and we are meeting next week. And I'm not quite sure what we're doing on that. That's it for committees. Okay. Uh, ordinance meeting will be on April 21st at 9.30. Um, we have a couple of different things that we're talking about. One of our biggest issues is parking. Um, I've also been meeting with the people from Higgins Beach about their parking issues down at Bayview. Um, we've made some progress there, which is nice to see. Um, we have a good group, and we meet again in a couple weeks, so hopefully we'll have a proposal um, to get back in front of the Ordinance Committee to try to make some positive changes down there for all of Scarborough, um, which I think is something really important to remember. And that's it for me for tonight. Uh, the planning board met on Monday, and one of the items was uh, a review of the uh, prime Mercedes-Benz contract zone, uh, and it was well received. And it will be forwarded back to the council. I uh, I'm be assuming on the, uh, in, April 15th agenda. Uh, okay. Nice. Uh, everybody was uh, very, very pleased with what they wanted to do there. So. Yeah, two, two things. One, the uh, Senior Advisory Board met on March 17th, and actually they had a conversation around age-friendly communities. And actually, kind of as it relates to this conversation, they shared some stats saying that, which is really kind of a surprise to me, 49% of the Scarborough community is over age 45, which is kind of puts it in contact. Actually, 17% are over 65. So when we, as germane to our conversation we're having tonight, there's a lot of people on the tail end of their earnings spectrum and or fixed incomes. And that kind of puts it in perspective. Although as they talked about age-friendly communities, the senior advisory were looking to partner with others. They think it's too big for them to do themselves. They really want to partner with some other initiatives around town, other partners. So that was kind of that conversation. The second committee meeting was the transportation and the work at Oak Hill intersections progressing. What they're recommending doing now is doing a lot of work around the timing of the lights, making it safer for pedestrians, doing a lot more sort of with crosswalks and other things. One of the big conversations was whether or not to take out permanently the right turn lane that's in front of Walgreens. And the decision for now was not to do that, um, to maybe try to test. There's 90 cars an hour that use that maybe sometime during the year, test just temporarily closing off the lane and seeing what type of traffic congestion it does or does not cause, and then make a decision after that. So that's sort of where they are. So they're going to do the, the traffic light improvements, which they think will improve traffic flow, and then play around with that right-hand lane that, that turns right in front of Walgreens is, is appropriate or not. And I guess that's it. All right. And over to me. Um Historic Preservation is going to have its final, what they expect to be their final meeting um, for, for that committee um, on Tuesday, April 7th at 6.30. They'll be um, just reviewing um, a list of areas that they've been working on um, that would be appropriate for signage markers and then which historic buildings are on the register that need plaques. Um, Housing Alliance meets Thursday, April 16th at 6.30. They, they met... Um, a couple weeks ago, um, I did attend their meeting. They did um, elect their, their, their officers for the year, their chair and their vice chair. Um, they also have begun having some discussions around um, potential property that the municipality owns, um, not un 
on similar to the concept of the Broad Turn Road project, if there is some property that we own and it has development potential, what, what could that be um, for some kind of joint partnership again with, with another identity? So um, they're identifying a few, few of those and reviewing those details. Um, appointments will need to meet. Um, I know it's busy in budget season and lots of constituents getting in touch with all of us about many, many of these issues. Um, but if we can meet for May 6th, that's the first meeting in May, May um, prior to the council meeting. Um, that's it for my liaison reports and counts, um, off to item number 10, town manager report. Thank you. A uh, couple quick things. Uh, just regarding the budget, I will certainly have the full budget uh, up online tomorrow by midday. Um, there's just a couple of fine tuned things we need to do to convert it to a PDF file. I'll also put the presentation on with the corrected date for the school board uh, meeting, uh, so that'll be available as well. Uh, with that a bit to the side, that's been a preoccupation of mine for weeks, if not months. Um, I'd like to attend, turn my attention back to some of our other priorities. Um, I know uh, council priority has been communications. It's something that slipped during the budget preparation process, so I hope to get back up to speed in that regard. Uh, also, as the council will recall, you changed the policy regarding uh, disposi disposition of tax-acquired property, and that's a fairly big project to kind of get that back on track. I have had communications with a number of folks, uh, and so uh, I think as soon as next week I'll get back uh, full steam ahead in that regard. Just a couple of dates I would like people to be aware of on behalf of the school and school board. Uh, they'll be hosting the third community dialogue later this month, April 30th. That's at 4.30 in the afternoon at the Wentworth Cafeteria. And for those of you that have not been part of that process, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I really encourage you to. Uh, I assure you, you'll, you'll learn something mm -hmm. in the process. And also for members of council, um, and school board, uh, the Scarborough Community Chamber will be hosting its annual uh, dinner in recognition of all of your efforts to serve the community. Uh, it's scheduled for May 19 at 5.30 at Piper Shores. And the last thing is, um, almost as if they know the date, uh, plovers were seen on Pine <laughs> Point Beach. Uh, so I Evil just words. want people to be aware of that. Uh, this early date, I'm sure they're just scouting testing locations, but nonetheless, be aware. Uh, they have returned. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Crazy oh, bird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> I feel like a twitch. <laughs> and council member comments. We'll start on this end. Peter. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for staying tuned and staying plugged in. Um, I think I'll echo some of the other comments by council. Yeah, as you can tell, this, this budget season, I think, is going to be challenging, and I think it's going to involve a lot of community conversation, a lot of decisions about how best to use the resources that are available and what we want to invest in. Just really encourage everybody here and at home, be engaged, get the information, make sure you ask a lot of questions, make sure you let all of us know um, what your feelings are, what your thoughts are, show up at some of the events, because I think it's going to be a really, it's going to be your decision about what you want to do for this community. So I think you've heard a lot of things tonight. But really, we're going to really need your help to help guide us on what this community wants to do. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Tom and George for the great presentations tonight. Um, even though now I'm not happy with the numbers, but <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's a good start. Um, I think we have a long ways to go, but uh, I think. With the way this uh, new process is set up, we have well over a month to start streaming things, uh, streaming them down, and hopefully we'll come up with a, uh, a reasonable tax increase that's uh, affordable to almost everybody. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add um, thank you to Ruth and Kate. I know you guys are under... <laughs> It's not easy what you do, and I, I, I'm amazed sometimes at the questions that you and Tom and Dr. Entswish will get, and you produce <laughs> <laughs> the paperwork back to the people in a quite uh, fast fashion. So I thank you for that. It makes our job a lot easier. Um, I wanted to mention that um, it's Celebrate National Library Week. 
and Portland Pie, who I, I can never say enough good things about Portland Pie. I mean, these people do so much for our community and constantly will hold a fundraiser for people. And um, so this is for the library. It's a dollar from every pizza and a dollar from every shipyard beer. Um, <laughs> it's budget season. Um, Thursday, <laughs> April 16th. Did I say that? <laughs> Thursday, April 16th from 5 to 9. Um, dine in or take out. So any either either or your order will help your or order will raise money to support the library and they're also doing some raffle items which is pretty cool so that's good stuff so I very much encourage you to go out and support the library they need that um, and then I just want to thank um, the school board and um, I know I see out back our fire chief and our police chief and our deputy chief out back. Um, Thank you to all of you for sticking through this process. I'm very encouraged with how things are going up until this point. Um, I know that Sean um, and Mr. Chiazzo both have been working very hard together, and that is, I think, something that I think is going to be proved to be very beneficial <laughs> to all of us. Um, I think we're going to see some good things come out of this. So thank you. Jim Marie? Yeah, I just want to add to, again, Thanks to the school board members and the superintendent um, and our town manager for um, wor working together with our finance committee um, to start this budget season in a little less acrimonious, how's that for a fancy word, uh, <laughs> um, manner. Um, I think when we start out this way, hopefully we'll end up in a, in a place that everyone, well, I guess the best way to put it is no one will be happy because everyone's going to have to give up something, but everyone will walk away saying, well, I'm satisfied. I mean, we got what, what we really needed to make as many people as possible satisfied with, with what we're doing with the budget uh, program. Uh, Jackie Perry handed this to me at a prior meeting. <laughs> She's in the front row. Um, just a reminder, there are, uh, this blows me away, there are over 100 students in the Scarborough schools who go hungry when they aren't at school and able to eat the food that's provided by the school nutrition program. Uh, and they are going to be going on vacation in another week. Right? I'm looking at Two the weeks. front row. Two weeks. Uh, we have a backpack program where we look for monetary donations um, or are you, food. did you also take food donations? Yeah. I'm looking at all of you, yeah, yes. Or food donations. Kathy said, G uh, Jackie says, read, read that, Jean Marie. Uh, if you would like to make a monetary donation, checks are payable to the Scarborough Backpack Program or cash. Uh, items below are in desperate need and cannot be bought any cheaper through different types of food programs. And this is what they're looking for. Canned veggies, spaghetti sauce, pasta, cereal, Pancake mixes, muffin mixes, hamburger or tuna helper, and canned fruit. Uh, apparently, they're totally out of that. So, uh, if you would like to donate to that, um, is or now the TV. Wentworth School is yeah. the yeah. Judy Campbell at the Wentworth School. I'm being coached from the front row. Yeah, but please, 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 please help out uh, with that. Um, these kids depend on us uh, for that. Um, and I, w I was going to tell you the plovers have arrived on Pine Point because I've learned that on Facebook this morning. Uh, the Academic Decathlon program, they again won the states and they would like to go to California. They're trying to raise $5,000 uh, and they're looking for donations. And if you're interested, you can get a hold of me because I know how to uh, get that up. Or Jane Ling, who's on the school board also. And that's it. Uh, I would like to join the others in, uh, in commending uh, our budget directors, Ruth Porter and Kate Bolton, because they're very professional, uh, and they're very qualified, and they're very cooperative. Uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, a, a pleasure to work with both of them. So I wanted to add that. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, I, I saw Chief Moulton and Chief Thurlow uh, in the back, and uh, they really are... Uh, they run exceptional departments uh, and, and should be recognized as such. 
I also want to thank the letter writers. We've gotten a lot of mm. <coughs> letters recently uh, on uh, paper bag, uh, mm. the, the tax impact, and and it challenges our thinking when we when we see this because uh, I read them. Uh, uh, Jean Marie always beats me to the punch and gets a response <laughs> out, which generally reflects my view, but not uh, so it saves me. The, but I I do I do enjoy them because it's it's an important part of the challenge to say. Is your view right, or should it be perhaps a little bit different mm -hmm. than you thought it would be? And uh, <coughs> uh, some of these issues are challenging in that regard. So thank you. Thank you. A um, couple items. First, uh, if you didn't get a uh, chance to catch the meeting prior to this meeting, we did have a workshop around our audit for both the school and the town, and it came back um, exceptionally clean, and I, I wanted to... Uh, thank the manager and the superintendent and their staff and the finance departments because uh, um, there is a lot of work that goes into uh, operating the finances and having a good healthy financial department and uh, it's reflected in uh, the professionalism and the level of sophistication with our financial reporting so I want to thank them uh, for the work that they do I remember many years ago um, those uh, workshops would be a lot longer because the auditors comments were uh, um, considerably lengthier so um, I really do appreciate uh, the work that they do on that. Um, wanted to mention, uh, actually, Karen Martin, from, um, CEO of uh, Sedco, uh, sent out an email earlier, and I thought it was worthy to mention uh, the content. Um, Main Biz uh, named 2015's Business Leaders of the Year, and two Scarborough residents were named in that. And so I wanted to congratulate Jim Wellahan, who is president and CEO of Lamy Wellahan, as well as Doug McKeon. Uh, the CEO of Woodward, uh, Woodard and Curran uh, for being um, uh, recognized uh, for their excellence in leadership and business. So um, congratulations. Um, really want to thank the citizens who came out tonight um, and spoke. Um, it's always hard um, to get up and speak and try to articulate and try to really express a mo a sometimes what can be a very emotional position um, as it relates to services that we receive or services that you may deliver because you work for the town or the school department, um, and then the financial impact that it happens. And it's, a, it's always a testy balance. Um, and it's um, always the time of year when you're sitting in this seat uh, that you question why on earth did I run. Um, but in the end, you know, the great part of the, the solution or the great part of the process that we undertook this year was it was about building a relationship um, so that the town became more comfortable with the working process that we do undertake in the budget. Um, and the big part of that was understanding each other's roles and respecting that. And I think that we have um, made considerable uh, progress in that area. Um, and I, I really want to thank uh, Chris Siazzo on the school board, who I've worked with very closely in that process, as well as the other members. Um, the third part of that process, though, is, is now trying to find workable solutions. Um, and that's where we take those norms that we created in that environment, which includes having a little bit of humor, um, so uh, the funny, uh, you know, this being April Fool's Day is a perfect day to recognize the humorous part of what we do. Um, but we have a lot of work ahead. Um, and, I, and I'll be honest, um, I am reserved in, in judging whether or not the proposals that are being made um, are too high or too little, simply because I don't know what is included in that. And I do need to have more information before I can say that, because one of the key things about... Um, um, investments, and that's what we're making, um, is that it needs to be done at the right time, in the right cycle, and at the right moment. It's like buying stock. You don't buy stock when the prices are high. You buy stock when they're down. Um, and so um, investing in your, in your municipality is almost similar to that. Um, and this may be the time for the actual investment. How much we invest is obviously debatable, and we're going to work on that. Um, I've, I'm, I'm evolving just like you and everybody else. So I came into this with a very strong opinion regarding uh, pay as you throw, or, um, or I just call it the trash bag program, because um, that's what it really is. It's just a fancy name. It's a you pay for a trash bag program. Um, and that's evolving no matter how much I support it. So I will continue that evolution and work through um, the work that we have ahead. And um, lastly, I wanted to mention was, um, oh, I mentioned this before. You know, it's about the selective outrage that citizens seem to have. And it's funny because of this trash bag thing, you know, I would have thought, um, you know, I was, you know, like, you know, declaring Armageddon on the town uh, based on the emails that I received. <laughs> and I will say, um, and I acknowledge, 100% of every email I've received, and there's about 
a good 50 of them, um, have been negative and said that they don't want this program. And I've lived in my community, or my, my little cul-de-sac, for about 18 years. Um, I live on the corner of two streets, and I wave to everybody, no matter who they are. I always wave. Um, and the great part is that uh, not too many people have really come over and talked politics. And this is the first time anybody's ever come and talked politics in my neighborhood. And boy, did they tell me what they thought about trash bags. <laughs> I thought they were going to shove me in a trash bag. <laughs> So, um, so at least it's getting uh, the neighbors out and talking about it, so it's a recognition of spring. But again, it's an evolution process, and I look forward to even hearing more information about that. Um, and I do appreciate everything that we all do, including the school board members. Thank you for serving. Um, it's hard work, but it's fun. All right, so I'm last. Just a couple quick things. Um, Councillor, disclosure statements are due in by April 30th. Thank so you. please don't forget. Um, those also do need to be notarized, but it just so happens our town clerk can do that for you. So please stop by and, and, and get that taken care of. Um, as was mentioned earlier, there is a workshop at 6 p.m. on April 15th around the trash program. So we should all be able to have the opportunity to hear a little more about what, what that program is that we currently have, what we're looking to maybe do and, and move forward to, and you know, um, the pay for throw bag, of course, will be part of that conversation. Um, I do want to offer um, just a, a brief moment for, um, I'd like to give our congratulations and actually our appreciation. Um, as you probably know, that there was the fire on the corner of Gorham and, and Muzzy Road, and I think I did circulate to all of you this, but um, just for, for the folks at home to know, too, that there was a young man by the name of Michael Libby, and he is a uh, junior here in Scarborough High School, and he was commuting between school and, and, and class and uh, came upon that fire and stopped and actually picked down a door to go in and, and help look and, 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 you know, make sure people were safe and, and just wanted to take that moment to really recognize what an outstanding young man this, this man boy is. Um, and our gratitude, that, that's what we hope for, for, for our future, people that care enough not to just drive by. You know, you stop and you help and, and you assist in any way you can. Um, and, and that's really just an out, outstanding moment and, and we should all be very proud that we can say this young man lives in our community so um, so I do have um, unfortunately a little bit of a not so happy note um, I did I was passed along that Harvey Warren passed away um, so if you are um, at all familiar with the Warrens um, they were very integral with Scarborough Land Trust and of course um, we recently purchased with well through the Land Trust purchase Warren Woods on, on Payne Road, which is 160 60 acres. Um, so, um, like I said, very integral in, in the land trust and early on in development and, and a lot of things. So um, our condolences to the Warren family. Um, and last but not least, believe it or not, it is spring. Bunny, there's a certain bunny that might be hopping along on, on Sunday and running past your house and leaving presents. So um, with that, <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> <laughs>